Welcome to Backpacker Radio, presented by The Trek. I am your co-host, Zach Badger-Davis. Sitting to my right is... Hi, I'm Juliana Johnson, a.k.a. Johns. Just one reminder for today, because it's so important. I don't want to muddy it with other nonsense. We are doing a live podcast. It is official. After many weeks of trying to search for the correct venue partner, it is now set in stone. We're going to be at the Skylark in Denver on Broadway on April 23rd. The doors are at 6, show at 6.30. $25 for tickets in advance. They could sell out. So if you want to go, definitely don't wait. We have a super special guest. He's been on the show before, and it's probably not who you're thinking. Uh, the venue is 21 and over only. Sorry, kids. Kids probably should not be listening to the podcast anyways because we say stuff like fuck and piss and what else? Shit. Oh, gross, Trons. Come on. I know. I'm the worst. <laughs> uh, the venue is not ADA accessible. Sorry. Can't have it all. And the link to get tickets will be available in the show notes. So if you need more reminders, just rewind that a minute and listen to that one again because it's so important. Uh, We'd love to see you guys at the podcast. Okay. No more beating around the bush. Excited for today's interview with Elon Stribling, also known as the Black Steve Irwin (laughs) and the Flyest Fisherman. He's a stand-up comedian, wildlife biologist, educator, and fly fisherman. Elon regularly tours across the country and recently won the 2023 New Faces competition at Comedy Works. He also created a series called Comedians on the Fly, in which he combines his passions for comedy and conservation. Elon, thank you so much for joining us here on Backpacker Radio. Thank you so much for having me. It's fantastic. This is going to be a fun interview because we're going to get into some subjects that are very outside of our normal comfort zone. And uh, you'll learn just how incompetent Chance and I are in outdoors things that are not backpacking. backpacking. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The first thing is, can you tell us your funniest joke? Oh. No, I'm joking. Oh. I'm joking. <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, this is not going to go well. Yeah. He just gets up and walks out. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think more fittingly, what what got you into the comedy? What was the inspiration? Yeah, I've, I've, always, been a, I've always been a fan of doing stand-up and watching stand-up and public speaking. I think, um, as you know, a lot of people have a fear of public speaking, and it's a lot of people's like biggest fear. And to me, I think of it like a superpower. So growing up, I used to see – people just giving speeches or people on the side like I was just like that's so cool and then I remember I watched my first comedy special which was Cat Williams uh it was in like 2000 maybe like 2009 or 10 or something like that and I remember watching it with the green top hat yeah okay. uh, uh I think it's called it's pimpin pimpin yeah, uh, yeah and I remember watching that and I didn't really understand all the jokes because I was in like middle school or fifth grade or something like that but I remember watching them and like they would do the shots of like the crowd and there's like thousands of people there. And I'm like, he's like talking to like thousands of people, just like telling stories and making them laugh. I was like, that's so cool. So ever since then, like a, like a switch turned on and I'm just like, so I just, I just love, I just love stand up. So in college I was, I was going through a, a weird patch of like, I don't know who I am. What am I going to do in the world? And then I was like, I'm going to go to an open mic and try to do stand up comedy. And I was like, if no one laughs, I can say I tried it. And no one ever, no one's gonna know who I am, and I could disappear. Or if people laugh, I can be like, "Hey, I did the thing that I always wanted to do." So, and then I just every night I just kept doing it over and over and over. And most nights were bad, most nights suck, but yeah. every once in a while, it's 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 there's the sweet moments. So, so did you get laughs on that first show to give you enough of that hit to want to oh, go the, back? Oh, the first show, I I did my set. I like told my jokes for four minutes. I got off stage and people were like, man, how long have you been doing comedy? That was so funny. Will you, do you want to go on the show? And I was like, it's my first time. And people were like, no way. Uh, and then the next like three months, I don't think I got one laugh <laughs> the entire time. So I was like, the first one was like, I was like, I'm the king of the world. I'm, gra- I'm going to be the greatest comic of all time. And then after that, I was like, what happened? Yeah. Like what happened? But then there was like that puzzle piece of like, which jokes work or like which jokes didn't work. So the first time I was like, if I don't know if I hit a, had a lucky night with very people who were just like sweet and were laughing or if I was actually funny and then the rest of it was just the next couple of weeks were just rough. Yeah. What was the theme of your jokes? Like what were you, cause that's, I feel like doing your first show is so daunting. How do you decide on what topic yeah. to kind of work it around? And what was it for that? I think I told a joke. I think I told a joke about it was like Black History Month. So I told a joke. I was like, if if you don't laugh, you're racist. I think that <laughs> got a good laugh. Uh, and then I told a joke about my cousin who smokes weed and he smokes weed so much that he forgot his shoes. He came outside one day like barefoot and he was holding 
we I don't know. And then I told a joke about bees and <laughs> some something else. I have the video somewhere. I haven't watched it in a long time, but I think it was just like stuff that I ideas because I've always like I've had a notebook of ideas I thought were funny. And so I think I just I wrote down ideas and I was like, I'm just going to say this stuff and we'll we'll see if it is funny or not. We'll see if it works. So uh, that's how it comes to me. I just I'll be driving and I'll be like, man, that's that's silly. I wonder if I can say that or I shouldn't say that. But then I'm like, I'm going to say it. And you just go up on stage and you say it. Sometimes people are like, that's the greatest thing we've ever heard. And then sometimes people are like, why would you say something like that? (laughs) How would you describe your brand of comedy in terms of like, is it kid friendly? Is it adult only? Uh, well, I, I work with I like work with middle schoolers. Yeah, uh, a lot. So I try I I try to uh, make my jokes like not I don't, I'm not a vulgar comedian. I don't like I'm not I'm not like vulgar just to be vulgar. I don't say like disgusting things or. I don't have any like poop jokes or anything like that, or like poop stories. We'll have to cross that question. <laughs> I feel like you've been primed on that. Did Rachel give you a heads up when she emailed you? <laughs> uh, at least I don't have any com- comedic stories. I have stories of, of being on boats or whatever. But, uh, but then uh, I also, I just like talking shit. Like I like kind of pushing buttons and uh, uh, I like whatever it's, si- like what I like just arguing, not to argue, but I like, I like, Whatever the the norm the normal conversation or like what the, the the thing that everyone thinks, I like going on the opposite side of that and sort being of the devil's advocate. Yeah, just sort of pushing buttons yeah. and being like, we're still silly, but also this is how I feel about stuff. And I also love nature stuff, so I've been writing more like animal jokes and I try to make animal stuff funny. So um, I, I I genuinely I like being silly on stage. I want people to be like, oh, he's silly and having fun, but then being like. He's kind of an asshole. He's like a little bit of an asshole, but it's like fun. It's yeah. just like I want people to walk away being like, uh, I, I don't know about it, but I, you're a sweet person. You yeah. Know? So I try not to be too, too, too bad. I did win the 2019 clean comedy contest, which is like no cussing, no sex, no drugs. Oh, that sounds hard. It was very, very difficult. Uh, and, and I won it in 2019 and I felt, I was like, I don't remember what jokes I did. Cause I'm like, I, I can't even imagine what I, what I would have, what I said during that. But yeah. so I, I can, you know, I can do both. I, I, I like all my favorite comics are comics who like, they don't need to cuss to be funny or they don't have to talk about stuff to be funny. They can talk about anything and make it silly and welcoming and yeah. People who, like who it. are some of your favorites? Uh, a guy named Chad Daniels. I'm familiar. Yeah. Uh, yeah he talks I, about his kids a lot. I love Chad Daniels. Yeah. yeah, he he was like he was like the first real comedy album I I listened to that I had on DVD or on CD. Um, and then I um, a guy named Jesus Trejo from LA. He was just mm-hmm. here in, in Denver this past weekend. Um, and both uh, those guys and like Bill Burr, Leslie Jones. I like people who like tell stories. Um, but all those people also talk shit. Like they mm-hmm. like part of their their stuff is like whatever crowd they're in whatever they just like sort of pushing the boundary and pushing buttons a little bit um so those those are my favorite comments people who tell stories and and who are sweet but also have like like messing around with people yeah i'm yeah. positive you've seen the uh, bill burr rant in philly where oh, just... I, it's one of the greatest comedic moments <laughs> yeah. of all time what is this he, he's literally at like a mega i'll let you tell it because i'm sure i'll butcher it yeah he's at like a mega stadium with a bunch of other comics and they're there to do like a comedy festival and they're in like a they're in like the football stadium of of philly and it's sold out and the first comment goes up and the crowd is like booing them and not listening and then the second comment goes up and it's like guys can you guys please listen we're trying to do a comedy show the crowd boos them or whatever and bill burr was like well i'm not gonna go out there and also gets booed for so for like 20 minutes on stage in front of a packed stadium of people he just tells them like you guys are the worst. I hope your kids get cancer. <laughs> I hope, <laughs> I hope, I hope the Eagles never win the championship. I hope all your mothers fall down the stairs. I like, and then he would like say something, and then be like, "I got 15 minutes left," and then go for like five more minutes and be like, "I got 10 minutes left with you animals." I hope you your big toe hurts. I hope just like the most horrible things you can say. Then people were like, people were booing him and he was like yelling stuff but then they were like got into the show and like we're like yeah yeah yeah, we love it and it's it's like one like comics always talk about like how how it was like a fearless moment uh everyone else on the show bombed but bill burr went out there and was like i'm not gonna do jokes for these animals i'm just gonna yell at them and and people love it it was like it's like a 
forever moment like it'll never i don't think it'll ever happen again like that how how sweet that was yeah, yeah. It, wow. it is amazing it's just a fuck you for 20 minutes i'll yeah. have to watch that yeah. yeah and it actually turns them around yeah, yeah. It, is, it is incredible and he, he even said like someone in the crowd he was like i was so disgusted because someone in the crowd like had an ear infection and so they, they like drained it into a cup and no. then someone else drank it. No. And then someone else threw up. Oh. And he was like, "It's like two girls, one cup." I <laughs> hate yeah, it's that. Like, he was like, "I'm not gonna. They're not gonna listen to my knock knock jokes." Yeah. I don't have anything. Philly people. That's what he said. That's the whole. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. So they, yeah, those moments are those moments are special. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You mentioned um, working nature into your comedy and animal jokes. What is the easiest animal to make fun of? Oh, the easiest animal, um, the easiest animal to make fun of. That's a great question. I was going to say, I have a lot of bear jokes. People call me the bear comedian. I have a lot of bear jokes. Bears aren't, they're not easy to make fun of. I feel like an animal that a lot of people know. I feel like cats. People make fun of cats a lot because cats are kind of assholes. So it's easy just to pick on cats and be like, we don't need them. They're mean. They can live without us. I'm trying to think of what, what wild animal is easy to make fun of. For some reason, I'm thinking bats. I don't know why, but I like bats. I don't know why anyone would make fun of bats. Like, I love animals, so I'm like, I wouldn't make fun of any animals. <laughs> I just... Do you have any fun bat facts? Uh, I do. I don't have any. I don't have any uh, well, bat facts. What animals would you focus on in your uh, studies as a wildlife biologist? I study, like, bears. So I study, like, mammalogy of Colorado. So it was, like, bears, mountain lions, elk. Okay. Bighorn sheep. That was like my my focus. So I have a lot of like a bear jokes, uh, just because I was like my main thing. And then when I graduated, I worked as a uh, nuisance biologist, nuisance technician, um, where I just like helped to relocate bears in Colorado. So that oh, was wow. like my whole that was my whole thing. So all I did was be around bears and talk about bears and stuff like that. So I'm gonna think about what animals are funny. So I'm gonna we throw can circle it in back. later. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talking about the wildlife work and your work with bears? Can you talk to us a bit more about kind of what you do with that and bonus points if you want to incorporate a few bear jokes on the way <laughs> <laughs> i uh well par part of it was like uh we, i used to so nuisance is like bears that get into people's trash break into cars stuff like that bother people at at campsite well i wouldn't say bother people at campsites but there's conflict at campsites and and uh, part of our job was like, part of my job specifically was like, if there was a bear encounter, I would have to go like track the bear and see like, is it a problem bear, you know? Or is it that bear that just like walked across the street and there were a bunch of people who took pictures and called CPW or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, How long do you have to follow the bear typically to get that report? Uh, usually until, until the bear either causes damage or until the bear just is like i don't want to be bothered anymore uh -huh. it's pretty remarkable how how fast a 200 pound bear can disappear hmm. which is scary and cool because i mean there were times where we would be following a bear and then it would go like around the corner and we would follow it around the corner and never huh. see it and no one saw it again yeah and or it would be in the tree and people would be like you see like kids walking by families walking by and we're just like sitting in the trucks so and no one gets too scared and we're just like yeah there's a bear and her cubs up in that tree and no one would even be like no bear didn't bother because the bears don't want to be bothered with people so that was our job was just to track bears make sure like people were safe um and then if it was a problem bear we would tranquilize it put a tag in its ear so we know which bear it was uh measure it see if it was male or female and then uh, relocate it just drive it as far away as possible to make sure that the bear was safe or the people were safe um, and then by the id tag people could like tell where the bear was removing and stuff like that so that was like an entire year that i that i got to do that which was pretty remarkable yeah, yeah. are you always tracking the bear in a vehicle or are you ever doing it on foot most of the time it was like in a vehicle mm -hmm. but then on foot is just like we see it we see the bear we have like a safe distance to the bear but then we're just sort of sitting or walking around or coming up with strategies with how to tranquilize it safely how to make sure people are safe around it so most of the time it was it was um in a vehicle and and uh, a couple of times there was a there was a bear that got into um someone's cornfield and was just like having a having a day just like <laughs> eating as much corn as possible and just like hanging out uh um in like this in like this pasture and we they were like do you guys want to walk through the cornfield and like try to spot or the bear we were like no we're not like some <laughs> children of the corn shit yeah, just kind of like <laughs> pop up on a bear who's just like laying down 
uh, eating of eating a bunch of food. So we just like threw it, flew it. Someone flew a drone over it, and we could like see where the bear was. Same thing with elk. We saw we got we found some elk that were in like a corn pasture and just bedded, just mm. laying down in a corn pasture, which was which was pretty cool. My grandfather was a biologist in Colorado, so it was like I got to do stuff, and then like I get to like share his stories are. He did it for much, much longer and did it for three years. But his stories are much, much like cooler and crazier. And it's, it's just like cool to get to talk to him about stuff like that. Have you ever been a part of actually transporting the bear like after it's been tranquilized? Oh, yeah. I've, I was a, I've been a part of like shooting the bear with a tranquilizer, oh. uh, catching it in the uh, with like a blanket once it falls out of the tree to make sure it doesn't get injured. You caught um, a bear that fell out of a tree? Well, yeah, they, we tranquilize them in the tree and then they sort of like they like are like you're not gonna give me and then they're like falling asleep then they're like holding on with the branches and then they fall and we like catch them with like a How with many like people blankets yeah this is not a one person job no it's like six <laughs> people yeah it's like six I was like you're people. so strong no it's like yeah I'm just like I got it I got <laughs> yeah. it everybody come here little bear I, got, I just throw it over my shoulder <laughs> don't worry about it no uh, yeah we like catch it with a blanket and then measure it tag and make sure it was like healthy and okay and then I slide it into like a a uh, a cage a trailer um and then drive i mean my, my first day of work like did training and then my first day of work we um relocated the young bear that was like my first day like i walk into the office i'm like sitting down i'm like setting up my little desk area and they're like hey we got a call we got to go um and they had already tranquilized the bear i show up and then we put him in a cage and we drove like two hours um and then let the bear go and I, they were like do you want to you the you're the rookie you're the first time here and they were like do you want to open the door so i had to like i was the one that like opened the door and i like hid behind <laughs> the door and then they had like those rubber bullets in case the bear like got frisky but they just shot the bullets into the air to like scare the bear away and it as soon as the door opened up it just like ran out and never looked back so mm-hmm. yeah what does a bear smell like does it have a discernible smell yeah they stink yeah. really yeah you can you can you can sometimes we would go places and you can like you would know that the bear was there or close by the w- just by the way they s- it smells it smells like like uh like dingy and like not wet but like uh you know like when you leave a little like clothes in the washer oh yeah, yeah like musty day, musty yeah. Yeah. and like just also just smells like shit like it just smells like shit it yeah. just smells like Bad Imagine stuff. they eat, or at least a lot of bears eat enough people food, which probably accounts for uh, why they smell so bad too. Yeah, I feel like most animal shit doesn't smell because they're just eating their natural. Yeah, it habitat. just smells like yeah, yeah. But like once you get, enter Cheetos and that sort of thing, the marshmallows. Equation, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it gets real stinky real quickly. Yeah, you can you can smell them, but it's uh, it was cool. I felt very blessed and very lucky to be able to do that. Yeah, where um, do they usually get transported to? Um, th- I mean, there would be like there's like different spots depending on where the bear got captured where the bear got tranked at uh but it was, i mean it'll just be like what it would just be like west like just into the mountains not like near Utah? campsites no no, no still colorado <laughs> yeah okay. uh Go still colorado yeah just uh just like not near campsites not near any major roads like we would take like you know atvs or big big trucks with four by with uh all wheel drive to make sure that we're f- far enough away from people because we want the bear that not go back to the city or not go back near the big dumpsters or whatever so with the dumpsters i think one of my favorite quotes i don't know who it's from but one of the favorite quotes i've seen is when they talk about doing the bear proof dumpsters and all that and how they say there's considerable overlap between the smartest bear and the dumbest human when they're (laughs) trying to figure out how to make the maneuvers yeah, work i'm in that camp for sure what um what is the smartest bear stuff you've seen have, have you seen any situations where bears have gotten themselves into situations where you're like, damn, how did you do that? Um, yeah, I mean, we one time we, we got a call that there was a bear in the neighborhood and we went to go look for it, didn't see it. Um, and then the we, we got a call the next morning and this woman was like, hey, there's a, there was a bear in my car. And we were like, oh, OK, is it still in there? And she's like, no, it's not in there. And we were like how do you know there was a bear in your car? I was like, is there broken glass? She was like, no, there's not broken glass. And so we go and like her car she had like left some food in there or something in there and it got all tore up and there was bear feces inside of Whoa. the car, but none of the windows were smashed. It didn't like break the door, but you could like see the claw marks on the door handle. 
So somehow it like opened the door handle, got inside the car, took a shit and left. <laughs> probably drove around for a little bit. Probably, probably like, picked up Karen. his pals. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She probably deserved it. Yeah, it was like d- it did whatever it needed. Went picked up its friends, like went joyriding, <laughs> brought the car back, and then got got out. So only reason we knew is because it was bear scat in there. And I'm like, th- I mean, that's a bear that's probably tried that saw that saw a bunch of bears open. I'm like, how does a bear? I think humans think we're so smart, but I'm like a bear opened a car door. Yeah. Like that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's pretty impressive. So that's that's something like that. And it was always like mother bears teach their their cubs stuff. So it's like we we would always be like, all right, if we if we can deter the the mother bears from coming into towns and getting in the trash cans and garbages or getting in the cars or whatever, usually the the younger bears aren't going to follow because that's not mom just ate you know berries and fruits and nuts and grass and dead stuff uh so yeah that was this that was the smartest bear experience i ever saw because we never even saw the bear or caught the bear that bear is has a cool story to tell still us on the loose friends. driving yeah. cars around yeah <laughs> <laughs> were you at csu when that guy was attacked by the mountain lion in, in, outside of Fort Collins, it was near Fort Collins, right? Collins. Oh, this yeah. last year. No, this was like a couple years ago. Six years ago, I want to say, or four or five, something I, in that range. I graduated two thousand eighteen. Okay, so you're yeah. not familiar with the story. No, I'm because there was a guy that was attacked outside of Colorado Springs like two years ago, last year. Yeah, maybe. Th- this was like the early days of the podcast. John. Yeah, we actually went to the press conference when it happened. I want to say it was probably like we tried our best to derail it. We were asking the <laughs> dumbest <laughs> fucking questions. <Yeah. laughs> I would love that. I would love to go through that. <laughs> uh, all right, well then I'll skip that question then. But the moral of the story was it was a runner and he got attacked by a juvenile mountain lion. They think that he had gotten like separated from his mom and it was just like he, was he sick or something like that. No, when they by the time they found the mountain lion, it was emaciated. So yeah. the guy got a lot of shit because. He um, couldn't fight off a skinny mountain lion. Well, they were like, you made it bigger than it is. The mountain lion only weighed X, Y, Z. And it was like, well, if you read the article, it was the body had been scavenged by the time they got to it. Yeah. And this weight is not the actual weight. overall weight of it. Yeah. But, you know, people on the Internet, they're reading half the story. Yeah. Um, but it was, I mean, big and big in Denver news for a couple yeah. weeks. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you said you did. You do work with mountain lions, too. How does that compare to the work with the bears? Um, we never saw we trapped and relocated a couple mountain lions maybe like three or four um those are the so those are i had never like seen a mountain lion up close but those are like the most remarkable animal i think i've ever seen in person like that close because they they you just think like oh it's a cat and you see them on i saw them on tv or whatever i see them in research books but then you see them in person they're just like muscle they're like just muscle and the way they look you're like you yeah you could absolutely kill me in a heartbeat and And you're like i then you're like i don't stand a chance and then uh, i used to work for the rocky mountain conservation corps and uh we went on like a training day and the guy was like uh we do have mountain lions in the park we do have mountain lions in the park uh we have quite a few more than you would like to imagine and just know that even if you don't see anything you're always being watched so (laughs) and we're like all right, cool. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. <laughs> Thanks, man. That's very comforting. But uh, um, yeah, th- those were easy because they would like kill livestock. And then you just take f- some of the dead livestock or you would kill something and then put it inside the cage and then open, leave the cage open, let them crawl in there. It shuts and then just pick up that we would pick up the cage and put it on the truck, drive them far away and relocate them. So mm-hmm. um, that that's a, those are the like three or four instances we did that um but yeah they're they're like they're they're such a they're such a cool animal even like the juvenile ones i'm like there's there's no way i would i don't i don't know how i would fight off a mountain lion at all yeah yeah that's where acceptance comes in i i used to talk about when i did the pacific crest trail i did a lot of night hiking yeah i'm five one i'm slow as fuck yeah um but i would hike with my headphones in because every time you're night hiking you can't see what's around you yeah you hear the twig snap, you get scared. And yeah. at that point, I'm like, what am I going to do? Yeah. Like, realistically, if this is how <laughs> things are going to go down, what am I yeah. going to do? So I would blast music in my ears and my headphones just so that I wouldn't Drown hear anything. Out. Yeah. I'm like, you know what? Let me realize this is happening when it when bites my yeah. neck <laughs> yeah. and not any sooner. <laughs> yeah. There's something comforting in being like, I'm look, I'm just going to die. I might as well jam out a yeah, little bit. Yeah, cool I'm story. I vibe out, yeah. <laughs> uh, just quickly, back to the bears is there an area that's notorious for problematic bears? Because, like, I've been to... Boulder. Yeah. That's a big one. I know my parents live there. And they're yeah. just, like, their trash is always getting knocked over. Yeah. 
Yeah, just just Boulder, and then only uh, it may be probably Colorado Springs, like not Colorado Springs, but uh, what's what's west of Colorado Springs? Um, a great question. Uh, whatever, what small towns are up there or whatever, but um, I mean, just places that are like where bears live, like that's that that's it. So I mean. Golden pro- Golden has probably a lot of bears that come every once in a while, but it's mostly Boulder because they're just they're in the foothills. Yeah. They're like, why aren't there more of those problematic bears in Golden? That's never made sense to me. Um, that's that's a great question. I just I just I I don't think I feel like I feel like Boulder outside Boulder, like the Netherlands and stuff like that, is more uh, uh, forced and wide open. Is is more like naturalized? Is there's more like I feel like west of Golden is more more cities and highways and roads and stuff. Mm. You see a lot of like there's the Buffalo Bills grave and you know I I feel like there's kind of some pasture areas where I see a lot of people that have bison or there are bison. Yeah, off seventy, yeah. you will often see bison Maybe up there. Maybe it's uh, less wooded. Yeah, I, but I know they exist. Uh, a friend of mine actually got charged at Apex Park in no South way. Golden, so they're out here. It's just yeah. Once the word gets out that we've got the sweet, delicious trash that's not yeah. exceptionally bear proofed, I feel like. The tide's gonna turn real quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great question. I I just I don't know. We had the most encounters. Like even in Fort Collins, there wasn't that many encounters. Um, the the foothills of Fort Collins, and uh, I I don't know. I just maybe Boulder's more uh, has more people in it, so probably more mm-hmm. trash. Yeah. Um, and also I I kind of feel like sometimes people in Boulder maybe attract bears or have, leave out bird feeders or food sometimes because they love animals which is beautiful i also love animals but that can cause bears the coming out so i just maybe it's the number of people and like the the proximity to actual like just people's backyards is the foothills of boulder yeah i know the one time i stayed in aspen bears are a big deal up there as well yeah like it's like clockwork every night once the sun sets like the bears are just like ravaging the dumpsters so maybe they just like really like rich hoity-toity towns yeah that's where you get the best foods (laughs) yeah Yeah. exactly the bear's like let's eat the one percent yeah right let's get them all (laughs) (laughs) um sweet i want to go back i don't want to move on from the comedy thing i don't know uh, I don't know what my question is, but I know that Zach it, loves comedy. I love comedy. Yeah. We went oh, on it. our, uh, we did a road trip for the podcast back in the early days, and we fit in when we were in LA to go see a comedy show. Oh, we went, we went to the comedy store. Oh, Who did magical. we see? Uh, we saw it. So Nick Swartzen, Tom Amazing. Green. Amazing. Yeah, Tom Green was, oh my God. So we got great seats because this was one of the things that we were planning for on the trip. And I've seen Tom Green on so many movies, but he was doing this bit where he was shouting like making his face go purple shouting and locked eyes with me and was just like like (laughs) almost spitting on me while shouting it was the best moment of my life (laughs) but we had the one guy that was he was roasting us the whole time because we were on a business trip i don't remember who he was (laughs) yeah he he started uh quizzing us because he asked if we were a couple not a couple uh, and then somehow it swerved to herpes, and he asked me if I had herpes. I don't came remember back that with, like, part. Some smart ass answer. I'm like, well, b- technically speaking, probably 75 percent of people have the herpes yeah. simplex virus. Yeah, he's like, shut the fuck up, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. But what it was totally. Yeah. Yeah, we were like, no, we're not a couple. Like we're technically here on business. He's like, oh, and he's like, and you have a wife, and he's like, yeah, and he's like, and this is a business trip, and he's like, yeah, and. The guy's like, you guys are here at a comedy show at night on a Friday drinking on a business, <laughs> business trip. trip. And yeah. we're like, oh, we fucking got this. <laughs> you just gave it to him. Yeah. You just yeah. tossed it up for him. Yeah. Um, are there any notable names that you've opened for? Um, I got to work with Chad Daniels. Oh, that's uh, cool. Notable names. Um, Jordan Rock, which is Chris Rock's little brother. Oh, uh, I got to open for Jordan Rock. Uh, I was just with Mary Mack in... Uh, Florida. Uh, the guy who voices the girl in uh, Bob's Burgers. Huh. Tina. Yes, I was. I got to open for the voice of Tina. It's a guy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So guy. that was pretty. So all the shows are sold out, and people were coming to hear him do Tina. Yeah. And he didn't do anything like that, <laughs> which is fun. Um, yeah. Those are those are just a couple of people I can think of. I got to open for uh, um, the guy from uh. Living single, uh, in living color, uh, one of the Wayne's brothers, not the Wayne's brothers, uh, Tommy Davidson. 
Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah. which was which was remarkable, and while getting to watch him work on stage and and how he interacts with the crowd and how he controls the crowd and he can bring them up or bring them down and just his work ethic over f three days of being on shows with him was was remarkable. Alonzo Bowden, I got to do Alonzo Bowden. Mm -hmm. So I got to work with some people who I, I, I got to work with Hannibal Burris. I got to do on a show with Hannibal Burris. I do too. So yeah. it's just like best step, like just people who I never would have imagined. Yeah. I'm like, there's a guy named David Borey who lives in Denver, uh, but he's like the voice of Comedy Central. So over the last, let's just say the last five or six years, any of those, ad, any of the commercials where you go like this Friday night, you can watch South Park on seven o'clock or watch reruns of the office or whatever he's like the voice who does oh. that and he's also an amazing comedian so i got to work with him a bunch so it, there's there's just so many people who i'm like oh you're this person you've been on this show you've done this but it's just like all intertwined so i got to work with uh, uh, amazing comics and denver denver has one of the best comedy scenes yeah really in the country yeah Com I didn't know that. Comedy Works is awesome. I mean, yeah. I know we have Comedy Works, but that, isn't that like having a McDonald's in your town? I feel like everywhere has a Comedy Works. That's insulting to Comedy Works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no. I, I think there's only two Comedy Works it. in I the enjoy country, it. I enjoy it. Well, yeah. There's, really? No, there's, there's only there's there's two in Denver. That, those are the those two. Those are the only two. That's it? Yeah. That's it. I thought because there was multiple that this was a big no. franchise. Yeah. Nope. There is, and if you ask a lot, if you um, watch, I listen to a lot of comedians podcasts, they go like, what are the best clubs in the country? And people go comedy store of course they go to the cellar they go other places madison wisconsin but then they go comedy works like really? it's one of like i would say outside new york and la it's it's either like denver maybe chicago and maybe austin growing now but it's denver is like the city you want to you want to be in well wow, i've been underappreciating the times i've gone then yeah no. I, I had no idea we are lucky uh have you met wendy before yes yeah so yeah she's the owner you should probably speak to this because i know nothing obviously but she's highly revered in the comedy circuit from my understanding yeah she like was started off as a bartender at comedy works whenever it opened in the 60s or 70s or whatever and just worked her way up now she owns comedy works and like gets gets comic i mean gets Chappelle to come on a tuesday wednesday night s sells a place out promotes it comics come and they're just like and the room is perfect for comedy it's small it's tight you're pushed together it feels like the, it's just it's one of the best rooms in the in the country mm -hmm. people, well, people have filmed specials there comedy works downtown comedy works south yeah i'm gonna look yeah. at it in a new light next time i'm there yeah, yeah. we had i i went to see john mulaney at red rocks oh, and it was amazing. a two-night thing it was right after he got out of rehab and Chappelle showed up not the night i was there but the night before and yeah. opened for him because he was here anyway so we were there and everyone was just buzzing about it like is he gonna it's show gonna, up again tonight yeah. didn't fucking show up yeah <laughs> Yeah, I've got to see Chappelle at Red Rocks. I got to see Bill Burr at Red Rocks. Um, and Chappelle, uh, um, what's the guy who plays the guitar? Who's kind of an, who's kind of annoying? John Mayer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, John Mayer showed up and was, like, playing music with Chappelle on stage. Like, Chappelle oh. would do jokes, and then John Mayer would, like, play a sound <laughs> of the jokes. And, like, make, and they were, like, yeah. riffing back and forth. Yeah. And I was like, it how is this even show. possible? Yeah, I was like, this is insane. Yeah. That, yeah. We got like a concert plus like Donnell Rawlings was there and like oh. all, just all these amazing people were that's at, awesome. at, at there. But that's all usually that's usually run through Wendy and Comedy Works. They have oh, something wow. called Comedy Works Entertainment. So Georgia Lopez was at the Paramount a couple weeks ago. Like she that's all Comedy Works put that together and stuff like that. So mm. the yeah. more you know. Yeah. What's it like hanging out with comedians in the green room? Like, are they funny, just interacting, oh, or are they professionals, or how does that? It is not for the faint of heart. Yeah, it is. People are like, "Oh, comedians say whatever on stage." I'm like, "You should listen to what comics <laughs> say in the green room because the green room is the most unfiltered, probably cultured place with best conversations you could be. Because it's just like it's on, like it's on like even comics who I don't like that much. We sit in the green room and we just combatively have conversations mm -hmm. and sometimes we're working like sometimes it comes out and then becomes a joke sometimes it's just like honest conversation about politics relationships mm -hmm. nature climate change i've gotten an argument with comics about climate change about the earth being flat about politics about whatever but it all usually stays in the green room and yeah. then unless a comic you know wants to talk about it on stage you can go out on stage and talk about it but it's usually we say ho horrible things to each other, but it's it's all just in like, ah, you're we're comics. We just understand like, what, uh. yeah. If you're I gonna if you're gonna come into the green room, there's been moments where people have walked into the green room, saw who was in there, and then walked right back out because <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're probably. We're gonna be like, you, you, why are you wearing those stupid shoes? Your shoes look stupid. <laughs> is this like, like the roast, roast room? room? Yeah. Yeah. Is this like the roast room? It it can be. Sometimes it's very. Sometimes you see we see a new comic come in. 
and they look like very timid and scared and we're like hey wait, are you on the show and they're like yeah it's my first time we're like all right cool that's where you see the light here's how the show works have fun you know whatever sometimes a new comic will come in and we'll be like this guy looks like an asshole <laughs> and then we'll just be like what do you and then we'll be like what are your bits what are, and we'll just like say stuff or be like man you, you really want to do that joke tonight <laughs> we don't think you should do that and then they're like should i not do it and we're like nah, it doesn't matter and yeah. then we just all walk out so yeah. it's just like it's like the bullying like but hazing, it's like yeah. yeah but it's like it's i mean i got it i got it bad every comic usually if you go into the green room it's supposed to be a little bit hard because you're gonna you might go out there and bomb and the crowd's not gonna be like hey we still like you they're gonna be like no you suck yeah. so i i find it comforting like the first time i walked in this comedy works green room i had like done other shows in outside denver or whatever and uh i'm not gonna name drop but one of the comics i walk in and she goes I, i'm like walking past and she goes are you eland and i go yeah she goes people have told me you're funny <laughs> and i was like as okay and then she just walked away she didn't have any follow-up she didn't say i thought you were funny she just said people thought you and i was like what does that mean am i fun dude should i be funny tonight like, i don't yeah. know until still to this day she's like i didn't say that i'm like you 100 percent. that was the first thing that anyone <laughs> said to me. It. yeah <laughs> but it's fun it's good yeah so okay again not as into comedy as zach is not that i don't appreciate it i'm just not immersed in it the way he is but what is the green room i'm guessing it's just somewhere you wait while you're waiting to go on stage yeah it's like am it's i gathering like, that correct it's like this it's this is green carpet in here green wall i don't know if i'm supposed to say that in you, case could, people yeah, come you can tell them what we got here <laughs> <laughs> we got a video camera yeah. running right now <laughs> um yeah it's just like the the interim it's just like where you go where comics go before the show starts so it's where the comic sits and has food it's where they're on their phones. It's where the comics wait to go up on stage. Why is it called the green room? Um, that's a great question. I wish I knew yeah. the answer to that. I just, I'm pr probably at some point, a room was green. Is. Yeah, some, there was a <laughs> room was green, and they were like, are you going into the room that's green? And they are like, how about we shorten this yeah. and just call it the green room? I bet we could ask your dad that he'd know the answer to that, because I think that's, it's well, called I, the green room for like all performance. I was thinking how, like if you go in front of a green screen. Yeah. Was in my mind, I, but if it's a waiting area, that, then it's not. I also don't know a single thing, so All I have right. no idea. Uh, are there any stories from the green room that you can share, like any particularly wild interactions? And you don't have to name drop anyone, but uh, like a conversation that stands out to you is something that's like especially funny or wild or. Um, no, nothing in particular. I mean, the green room is just. It's not as maybe rock and roll as like the 70s, 80s, or 90s, but I mean, you've seen, be we see people do drugs in the green room. Mm -hmm. We see people, you know, say say stuff to each other. We make a lot of jokes about whoever's on the show performing. We we talk a lot of shit about them. So I, uh, I'm i afraid to say, I'm afraid to hear what people say about me when I'm on stage <laughs> <laughs> in the green room. But that's just, you know, that's just how it goes. So there, there I mean, there's nothing in, I don't have any like particular stories of like, oh, this happened. You, you do hear a lot of uh, like, like gossip about usually usually it's like famous comics are like did you hear the story about what happened to this comic and they did this and it was this and then the next morning they didn't know like you hear stuff like that but also uh, it's just like well all right well that was cool it's not like i don't know that person i don't care that much unless it's like a you know a friend so it's just yeah it's just the green room is just a place where you just go and you hang out before you go up on stage after you go up on stage and it's usually good energy good vibes mm. people just getting ready to go up on stage working on their set sometimes yeah what's the best advice that another comedian has given you because i'm imagining that you're probably oh, yeah. exchanging <clears throat> thoughts a lot back there what's the best pieces of advice you've gotten um the best piece of advice was a guy named sam talent who's born and raised in denver um he's traveling all over the country and the world he just did shows in japan and uh i was asking him one time i was like how do i like what's the next step i'm like what what do i do i feel like i'm at sort of like a a lull and like i don't know what to do next and he's like just keep writing just just keep writing always keep writing and keep uh keep moving forward like just keep like you know taking your time but just keep writing like if you just keep writing that's the same thing and then i ran into judd apatow in new york oh, shit. Uh, i was leaving the comedy cellar and i was just watching because i didn't get up but i was just leaving the comedy cellar and i was like is that fucking judd apatow <laughs> And I was like, nah, there's no way. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's Judd Aptow. So I ran up to him. And I was like, hey, man, 
are you Joe Dev Tell? He was like, yeah. And then for like five minutes, we just like walked the streets of New York. And I asked him, I was like, like, he's like, what do you, are you planning on moving? Denver's great, but you got to move to New York, LA. What are you thinking? Blah, blah, blah. Like, and I was like, uh, do you have any tips for comics? And he was like, just keep writing. Just, just keep writing. So I think there's that thing of like, no matter if you're on stage, not on stage, if you want to write a short film, if you want to write a sketch, if you want to write the stand up bit, like you just keep putting those ideas of paper and maybe they collide maybe you figure out but just keep keep writing um and then another one that i always tell comics i'm always like try to like have fun because it's supposed to be fun and if you're not having fun then that kind of sucks like that and there's there's moments where i'm like i I gotta get this tape i gotta do this joke like i want to do well so it gets very strenuous but i'm always like the whole idea of comedy is like we're saying stuff and connecting to people to make them laugh if you're not having fun doing that, then why are you doing it? So I always tell comics, even newer comics, they're like, oh, I want to get to your level. Or I want to do this. I want to start traveling. I'm like, or are you having, are you having fun? Like you should write jokes that you like are like, this is fun for me. Mm-hmm. And like, you should do stuff that be fun for you. Cause then if you do that and the crowd sees it, the crowd goes, this person's having fun. I'm having a fun time also. And so I always tell comics, newer comics, I'm like, just, just have fun. Whatever you're writing, have fun, uh, treat the staff well. Always treat the staff well. Have fun. Show up on time, and leave. That's that was that was my that was when I first started. That was the that was my track. I showed up early. I did the best I could. I treated the staff well. I said thank you. I cleaned up my mess. I didn't want to be a issue a bother, and I left when I when the show was over. So, um, yeah, just have fun and keep keep writing. Those are those are my two things that I try to stick with every day. I saw Sam Talent open for Shane Gillis, and he was awesome. He was very yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah, he's one. He's one of those comics. There's a couple of comics where, like, other comics shut up and stop talking, or we'll we'll stop mm-hmm. talking in the green room, or I'll get up and leave the green room to go watch. And Sam Talent's one of those people mm-hmm. where it's like, we're like, all right, hold on, let's. I'll talk to you in like five minutes. I want to go watch Sam Talent because yeah. you never know what's gonna happen. You never know if he's gonna do crowd work, what kind of jokes he's gonna do, if he's gonna just yell at the crowd the whole time, if he's gonna whisper and make him laugh. Like it's he's one of those comics that other comics are like. Stop talking. We yeah, have to yeah. watch this guy. That's cool. Yeah. Do you have a dedicated time for writing? Like, do you do it first thing in the morning after a set? Uh, do you have like a routine with it? I I try to do it first thing in the morning. Um, most of the time that doesn't work. So I just I keep a notebook on me, um, with that which I have in my bag, and it just has like it'll have like one line or two lines. If I don't have my notebook, I have my phone in me, and I'll just text myself. I'll be like, um, you know a guy saying he's six feet and then he drowns in a pool that's 511 like i <laughs> like i just i'll te- i'll text that to myself and then later in the later that day or later that evening at some point the same day i go and i look back and i write it down because i like to i like to write it down so i'll write it down and i'll write out web association stuff i go through like my little thing and then that that night the next night i'll try it out or the next couple of nights i'll try it out so um I, that's sort of my process uh it was like i think about it I write it down or sometimes I'll be driving to a show and I'll be like, man, that's funny. And then I'm like, fuck it. And I go up on stage and I go, I say whatever my idea is. And sometimes I just say the idea. Sometimes I try to flush it out. And then usually if it goes bad, which is usually how it works, I go, all right, you know what? I thought about that on the way here and I apologize to everybody in here because you guys didn't deserve that. Sometimes it goes well and I'm like, I'm a genius. I'm the greatest comic of all time. <laughs> yeah. There have been ones that I've been at where someone will be testing a new joke and they won't get many laughs. I'm like, all right, that one's not good. Got yep. it. Okay. And they, I've had someone pull out a the like notebook. a notepad and write it down. And, and I think that's the funniest part. Like yeah. that gets me to laugh more than the joke would. Yeah. It's just like seeing that boundary be broken where you're like, got it. Okay. Back to my notes. Yeah. Well, just it's in front of us. It's true. Cause we, sometimes we have to go like, all right, that's the fourth time I tried it, and you guys don't like it. I will cross it out of my notebook, and yeah. maybe I'll keep working on it. But I know for a fact, it, you guys don't like it, and that's okay. And I, I always tell, I always tell people, I'm like, to be a good audience member, if you don't like something, don't laugh at it, because yeah. that helps more. I, li- I like sometimes when people don't laugh, and I go, all right, well, <laughs> I'm gonna keep doing this whether you like it or not. Yeah. I'm gonna finish this joke, so. It seems like you're comfortable with a joke that doesn't work, but I imagine there had to have been a point where you're bombing and like the feeling of not getting laughs has to be the most uncomfortable feeling in the world, right? Yeah, when I first started, it was like a, it's something you get over. You're like, it's just like an ego thing. Cause you like, after, let's say, a year of doing shows or doing mics and you get like comfortable with yourself and you get like, 
a lot of people think like comedians come up with material every time they get on stage. It's it's usually like six months to a year that a comic is like, I'm working on this five minute set. So these five minutes, especially if you're new, you're like these five minutes, I'm working on this. And so let's say you're a newer comic, you're a year in and you have like a killer five minutes. Like you could do it in Carl Springs, Denver, Florida, LA, New York, and it crushes. Like you're like, I know where people are going to laugh at. I know how good it is. And then one night you go up with that killer five minutes that people are like, man, you're so good at comedy. You're so amazing. You go up with that five minutes and you do your opening line where you usually get a laugh and no one laughs and you go, (laughs) okay, okay. This is going to be a long five minutes. (laughs) I'm going to get them on the next one. And then you do the next part where you're supposed to get a laugh and you go, okay, they didn't like that one either. And then you start sweating because you're like, okay, they didn't like the first two things. I don't know what else to do because this is the five minutes that I know. And so now, so then it's just like an ego thing of like, because in that, when you bomb, it brings you back to like, all right, well, I'm not as good as I thought I was. I got to keep writing stuff. I got to keep, I have to figure this out instead of just being complacent with like, oh, I was doing good. I was doing great. Uh, And I had a show two weeks ago in Boulder. I was on the Boulder Comedy Show and I'd been having great sets. I've been writing all this new stuff that's very fun for me and I I feel silly and I'm excited to talk about. So I like went up on stage and I was like, it's going to be a silly time. And the first like two minutes I didn't, I think I got like a couple chuckles Hmm. and I was like, I think I asked the crowd, I was like, hey, can you guys hear me? (laughs) And they go, yeah. (laughs) And I was like, so I'm just bombing? And they go, yeah. And I was like, all right. Time to bring in the bears. This feels good. Yeah, 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 this feels, this feels, this feels good. And I hadn't, I hadn't bombed. I've I've bombed before. And like, I bombed on shows where like, I wasn't even sweating because I'm used to it. It's like part of the game. It's Mm -hmm. like, it's a misstep. It's like when you're fly fishing and you're like, oh, these fish are going to eat. And, but they you see the fish, but they never eat. Like I've, I'm like, this is normal, but this one felt so uncomfortable because I, I, I realized I was bombing and I was like, I can address it and be mad at them and be like, you guys are a shitty audience. But in my head, I'm just thinking like, nah, dog, you just gotta be funny. Like, just be funny. I, I very rarely blame the crowd unless something is like happening in the crowd or whatever. I very rarely blame the crowd. It's I'm, if I see a comic bomb, I go, Write better jokes. Like, figure out your style. Figure out whatever it is. It's your fault. Don't blame the crowd and go, man, that crowd sucks. It's like, no, because I bombed, and then the comic after me went up and just smashed, and the comic after that just smashed. So it wasn't them. It was me, and that's sometimes hard to deal with. But it's uh, it becomes fun. The best part is when you bomb with friends and, like, other comics because that's fun. Like, when you see your friends bomb on stage, because you get to, like, sometimes my friends will try a joke and then it won't go well, like, where it usually gets a laugh, and I'll start laughing in the back, and then the crowd's like, what's happening? Yeah, like, I'm laughing at them. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, no, I'm making, he knows that I know this is shitty, yeah. and this is making him that's mad. That's the one sound he doesn't want to hear. Yeah, yeah, it's me <laughs> laughing in the back. So that's, that. then become, bombing becomes, it just becomes part of it. You're like, man, I had two weeks of great shows, everything's working, all the new stuff is working, you're like, then there's that bad one that comes, but then you're just like, all right, well, got another show later tonight, got another show tomorrow. We'll just try out the same thing. If it still doesn't work, then we'll, we'll figure it out. It's always just like keep moving pieces, which is fun. It's so fun. Yeah. Why do you think, like, if you have a five-minute set that is polished, why do you think it would hit with certain crowds and then bomb with others? Like, what is it, what is it that makes it work sometimes but not others? So um, it, I mean, it just, it just depends. Like you can always, you can always blame it, not blame it, but you can always put it on like demographics. You can always be like, this, these jokes, these jokes work well in like a very conservative room. Or these jokes work well in a very liberal room. These jokes work well in a black room. These jokes work well in a white. Like, you can always say like. Oh, because of where I'm, because I'm like, these jokes work in Florida. These jokes, jokes work in Chicago. Like you can always say that up to a point, but I feel like if you want to become like a comedian, you can't just only do the shows that you like, you want to do. But, and it's just like, sometimes some people just don't get joke. Like if you go to a small town in Texas and like talk about Uber or Lyft, like they may not have Uber or Lyft because it's just like a small town. So if I do jokes about like being in the Uber or like being in the Lyft in Chicago, they just may be like, and they may not what's not a, like an it. Uber? <laughs> yeah, those, they're just like, well, we understand this common idea that everyone else has because we are 
in Ubers anymore. Like we we just we don't use Ubers that much. We don't. We're just this is our town or whatever. Or if you go to like um um like I I I hate Portland so much. If you go to like Portland and I talk a lot. I I I talk a lot of shit about uh very liberal liberal white women and that's like a lot of my set but it used to be a lot of my set now it's only a lot of my set when i go to portland because i know that they hate it (laughs) so much and i i know and i know this goes back to you wanting to push buttons yeah and i'm i'm just like i'm just like uh, and it it bombs and i think it bombs because they they're they're i'm like talking at them and they're like we don't want to we are the good we're the good guys i'm like you guys are actually the worst (laughs) people uh but it's just like it's different demographics there's different rooms and stuff like that so i just think like i you know i go to chicago and if i try to talk about boulder colorado in chicago they'll just be like Mm -hmm. so what like we don't get why it's funny but if i told someone or if i like if in colorado if i talk if right now if i start talking shit about Colorado springs people would be like that's funny because Colorado springs they kind of suck and then talk about Pueblo and people are like yeah Pueblo sucks right if you go to another city and try to do that same material people are gonna be like well we don't know what what Pueblo is it's the, we don't get why that's funny sort of thing so I think as a good joke writer as a good comedian you should write jokes where it's like maybe you explain something but you like get the crowd to understand like what you're saying or tell stories or um, I feel like you know be more personal don't just be like you guys ever ride the train to DIA? And people are like, no, we've never been to Denver. But then if you're like, you guys ever go on public transportation and you could just change that like little thing. And then people are like, yeah, I've, we've ridden the bus or I'd know what the bus is at least. And so stuff like that. So that's why, you know, those those chunks can work in like different places. You can have a comic who is very, very good in Boulder. And then they go to Fort Collins, they go to Springs, they go to another city and they may not be that good just because they're so specific to to boulder you know mm. so uh i could talk about comedy all day but in the interest of what the podcast is we'll probably <laughs> talk about some outdoors stuff i've uh, got one more before we move yeah, on yeah, yeah. you mentioned you have your notebook with you yes can you read us the most recent lines in it oh absolutely i, re- <laughs> I worked on it before yeah. we let you go no, that's good i worked on low-hanging fruit here uh, i worked on it today so i have my so i have two notebooks here one is a black and bigger with my teeth marks because i when I get nervous, I like bite it. Uh, <laughs> and then this is the one, my set list. So I, a set list is like what you write. Like, w- like this is, I'm like, this is for this show. This is for this show. This is for this show. So I just like write like what jokes I'm going to work like on. Like a musician would. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, th- yeah, these are the songs I'm going to play right. for the crowd. And then these are just like the ideas. These are just like the, the thing so okay so i wrote today let's see i'll go to the very last page and i'm running out of pages this thing is sort of falling apart i'm running out of pages um uh denver health no that's that's (laughs) just my doctor's appointment (laughs) (laughs) uh okay yeah i'll 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 do the last two whatever (laughs) um this one says uh i don't like answering questions about my horoscope anymore so i just tell people that uh if they ask like what's my sign i just say i'm a thin mint rising uh because i just like girl scout cookies <laughs> that much <laughs> and i'm trying to i'm trying to write a joke where i like compare horoscopes but i just use thin mint, i just use girl scout cookies as the <laughs> horoscopes you know so i go up to someone and i'm like when's your birthday and they're like april whatever and i go that is so samoa of you, <laughs> you know <laughs> I and like that. Some, and like all my best friends are do dos you know? <laughs> uh, and then this is a swimming one. It's like, I, I love swimming. I went on the first date um, and the girl took me swimming. And I asked her after a couple of dates, I was like, hey, why'd you take me swimming? And she's like, to see if you were actually six feet or to see if you were lying. And I'm like, ladies, you guys should try that. Like you should, if a guy says he's like six feet, take him to a swimming pool. And see if, if he can stand up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if he's drowning or if he's on his tippy toes, then you know he's not the man for you, you know? And then uh, uh, I think I wrote, uh, do you want drowning baby? <laughs> do you want, you can't have a kid with him because then your kids won't be able to swim and they'll be liars. That's not what you want. Uh, and then... And I'm like, he would rather, this guy would rather die than admit he's not six feet. And then <laughs> they'll they'll bury a six foot grave and they'll stand him up and he still won't reach the top <laughs> of the grave. <laughs> so I wrote those today and I was like, I texted my friends and I was like, 
are there, what shows tonight can I jump on so I could like try this out? So I'll just I'll just do that. And I have jokes that I know work, so I'll take a couple jokes that I know work. Make sure the crowd's like, all right, we know he's funny. We'll give him a little bit of grace. I'll do. I won't tell the crowd these are new. I'll just do them like normally, and then on stage, I'll probably do that Girl Scout thing for way longer than I need to, and just see eventually like where they stop laughing and be like, okay, I can figure it out there. Or I'll do I'll do the swimming thing, and I'll be like, okay, this was good. They laughed at this. I need to rewrite this. This took too long, it's like that. And I record all of my sets like audio. Yeah. And so as soon as I get off stage, on the, usually on the way home, I play it and I go. Oh, I like the way I said that, or I need to say that. I need to slow that down. I need to explain that, or I messed that whole part up. And yeah. then I'll do the next night and just maybe do a little bit longer. Maybe take out an old joke and put a new joke kind of closer up and be like, let's see if it's actually funny. And then eventually I'll take the joke and I'll put it first. Because if a joke is, if as soon as I walk on stage and if I do a joke and it's funny, then I'm like, that's a good joke. Because the crowd doesn't know who I am. They don't know my character. They don't know if I'm funny. If I walk on stage and do a joke and they go, and they laugh, I go, okay, that's a good enough joke mm. that it could go anywhere. If a, if none of my jokes can go first, I'm like, these jokes, I need to rewrite it to be funny enough. Because then if every, every one of my jokes is good, then my whole set is just, it's fun. And the crowd leaves going like, man, we did not stop laughing from the beginning to the end. Whether it's five minutes, 25, 45 minutes, however that looks. So I love that. Yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, how often when, when you're trying new stuff are you just improvising on stage or is it usually like that you already have the concepts built out most of the time it's just and my friends call me Mr. Premises and no punchlines because I usually have an idea where I'm like that swimming thing is funny and then I'll go up on stage I'll do it and it really doesn't have an ending and I'll just be like alright next joke <laughs> and so I'll I'll go up there and I'll just I'll flail I'll just I'll just do that premise and figure out on stage naturally like what what would I say in the heat of a moment like I can feel the crowd laugh or if they're not laughing I'm like what can I say right now to make them laugh and so I'll I'll do that and then figure it out on stage and then come back write that part down or write be like that's not it or that is it and then try try it again you just pull out a sleeve of thin mints and just like enjoy the <laughs> silence for a minute <laughs> I, yeah it's it's fine and sometimes it is it is fun to make the sometimes on a bad crowd you can sit in silence yeah and i feel like they, they know that they're not supposed to be in silence so then it makes people start laughing and i'm like all right you guys are you guys this is gonna be fun yeah yeah, yeah. so that's that's usually how i do is just like sort of i wish i i was cool enough to say jazzy but it's sort of just like oh I know where I want to get to is just figuring out the whole little middle part. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Uh, so this podcast comes out on April 8th. Do you have any shows after that that you want to uh, push? I'll, yeah. Let me, I could, I'll have to look. You guys can chit chat. I'll have yeah. to look. Yeah. Sure. We'll talk I, quietly amongst ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have an idea for the Patreon. Yeah. Is I have a joke premise. I have not, I'm a terrible joke writer, but I have a joke premise. I want to pitch it to Ian oh. and see if he can. Oh, that would love that. A joke. I like this. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Let's yeah. do yeah. that for the and Patreon. And that's what my, that's what my friends and I do. We workshop, so we'll go and sit at a coffee shop and be like, "I have this idea." Yeah. We, and we'll tell the story. We'll tell the joke, and then they'll be like, "Take this off, or I'll be funny if you said this, or what happens if you did this." So I would love, I would love yeah. to do that. We could do that. If it's any good, I would be honored if you eventually got it on stage. It could be terrible, and I wouldn't be butthurt. You could start our live podcast with your own <laughs> yes. personal comedy. Yeah. Yes. Wow, I would love nothing more than to watch you <laughs> awkwardly no, flail I'm, on stage I'm for a few I'm, minutes. I'm pretty sure the premise is funny. I have zero confidence that I could actually work it into a funny joke, though. So that's why I'm happy to right, get an get a actual go. comedian's perspective on it. Uh, Should we like any word on the dates? get kind of relevant? For, oh, for the, the yeah. dates. Yeah, uh, April, whatever that Friday, Saturday is. Um, I'm at uh, with Comedy Works Entertainment. Um, it's like a, a it's it's an event. It's like on their website, but April fifth and sixth is Friday and Saturday. No, this comes out on the eighth, so the twelfth. Oh, twelfth and thirteenth. Yes, okay. the twelfth and thirteenth. Um, I'll be uh, I'll be with Comedy Works Entertainment. I don't know exactly where it's at yet, cool. but. Um, yeah, and then there's there's so many comedy clubs in Denver. I mean, everyone knows Comedy Works, but people can go to uh, my website, elonstribbling.com, and find comedy uh, sh my comedy shows. But there's the Denver Comedy Lounge, um, which is in Five Points, um, behind the Saki Bar. It's always full, always great comics. Denver Comedy Underground, um, and then the Comedy Fort in Fort Collins is, is becoming one of the best clubs in the country also. so We should do one of our hiker meetups 
for one of the De- for one of the Denver shows. That'd he be does. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. You can make specific hyping <laughs> jokes. Yeah, uh, flag <laughs> us the next time you've got a date at Comedy Works. Yeah, we love be that. Really fun. That'd be yeah. great. Um, sweet. Okay, let's talk about some outdoor stuff. Yeah. Sorry, every- sorry, everyone. Else. Sorry. No, that was no. That's to not, that's to, great to the non-comedy fans. Who, <laughs> yeah, that I don't hate know if laugh. non-comedy fans <laughs> belong here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I would love to talk about fishing and your show. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the show. Comedians on the Fly. Yeah. I, I watched a, a half of the episode before, or half of your most recent episode before, and I was really impressed by the production quality of this. Like, you had multiple oh, thank cameras you. out there. Thank you. You were interviewing um, a gentleman who was a writer for Kimmel. Yeah, his name is Trey Walker. Yeah. Uh, he's a writer for Jimmy Kimmel. He's actually... Uh, he helps write Jimmy Kimmel's monologue and jokes for the Oscars hmm. that are coming up. So he's he's legit, and he's born and raised in Denver, um, and one of the best joke writers I have ever seen. Yeah, personally, he was very funny on the fly. No yes. pun intended. Yeah, uh, just talking about like all the different casting things, sounding very sexual. Yeah, it, it got some good chuckles <laughs> out of me. Yeah, he Troy, Troy Walker. He's a he's a hilarious, and it's it's been fun to film, especially with and then I'm, I'm friends with them and look up to them, so it's easy just to like. Tell me comedy stories and let's mm. talk about comedy and while we fish. So, do you work with a production company for that, or is this all your own setup? Just it's it's all it's all me. I'm looking to get sponsorship. I'm looking to get help because it, it, it like we've done six episodes so far, um, and the first two episodes was just a guy I met and I was like, hey, can you just film this for me? I just need help. Um, and then there this past season, these last four episodes, uh, a comic named Jeff Stonic helped me, um, and he filmed it and and we edited it together. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just yeah it's just me i just i i i I believe in it and i love this idea of like taking comics out of their element of the stage and putting them where i love in nature and water and and talk about conservation talk about fishing talk about whatever they want to talk about uh and then have them just tell stories or say like sexual stuff about fly fishing or uh i have one of my friends did it uh he's from queens he's a comic and he like grew up in Queens, New York, and he's like, "What's all this nature shit?" And I was like, "I don't know, it's beautiful." And he's like, "Nah, this shit, is there a McDonald's?" Like he just he's used to. So it was like it was fun to have comics come out, and eventually one day, I want you know I want Bill Burr to be on it, and I want Leslie Jones to be on it, and I want all these like big comics who I've dreamed of having or, or I look forward to meeting or working with. I want them to be on it. Uh, but it's it, you know it's just yeah the production stuff I I value and like. I pitched it to a couple companies and they're like, Oh, we love it, but we want to change this and this. And I was like, that's a great idea. And I think that's beautiful, but that's not, I just want this to be a place where people can come and sit and watch it and tune out and like, not feel like it's like politicized, not feel like Mm -hmm. it's has an agenda. Like you're just watching a comic fly fish. That's it. It's just, your brain is turned off, but you're like laughing and Maybe you're like, oh, I want to go fly fishing, or like, oh, I want to go see this comic perform on stage. So um, that's like the 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 feeling behind it. And I just I love fly fishing and I love comedy. And I was like, what's the best way I could do both? So yeah, I love the premise for the show and the fact that you're doing the production yourself is impressive. Cause yeah, I was I was honestly that was the first thing that caught me was how two different camera angles, the yeah. audio was really good. Uh, very Thank well you. done. Yeah, that means a lot. Yeah, um, definitely check out the show. Very funny. What got you into fly fishing originally? Um, my grandfather. My grandfather was a uh, uh, well. My my grand my grandpa my papa. Uh, he was like a he was the angler that took me out when I was in elementary middle school. He would wake me up at four a.m. and we would listen to BB King all the way to the store to get some worms and then go sit on the lake edge for eight hours. And I would be sitting there and I'm like, this sucks. And that's how I, how, how I kind of got into fishing. And then my gramps um, in college, I, I, I needed um, some extra credit in one of my classes. And my instructor was like, hey, if you take this fly tying class, it was like my freshman year, if you take this fly tying class, you'll get extra credit. So I was like, cool, I've heard of fly fishing. My, I think my gramps does it. Um, I'll take the fly tying class. So I took the fly tying class and I walk in and the guy who was teaching the fly tying class was like Theodore and Theodore's my gramps' name. And he was, I was like, no that's my grandpa that's my grandpa's (laughs) name and he's like you look you look just like him and i was like okay okay and he's and then that guy was the academic advisor for my grandfather when my grandfather went to csu 
And wow. so then he was like, I got all this. I got some fishing stuff. You can have it. And then my gramps came and I found out my gramps is like a huge, huge fly fisherman. And I never knew that because I didn't get to go on him on trips and stuff like that. He was always, he was in like Michigan and Florida and Colorado. So, um, so then I started taking that fly tying class. Uh, and then I also took it with a girl and we were like, part of it was like, yeah, this is going to be like our date for like four Saturdays every morning. We like wake up and that didn't work out. But, uh, I just fell in love with fly fishing. It was it was sort of the same thing of comedy. It was like th- three years, two years, three years before comedy where I just like, it was like the puzzle pieces thing. It was like, I remember the first time we went fishing, like after we graduated the class and we're like fishing for carp. And I remember seeing these, these massive carp like swimming the banks and like on the edge of the water. And we would like put our fly out there and like watch the fish and the fish would like come over, look at it and then like swim away. And my brain was like, well, why did that happen? How do I make, how do I catch that fish? Like, what do I need to do? Do I need to tie a different fly? Do it doesn't need to be a different, like my brain couldn't stop. And I just, I became like pretty obsessive over it where like before class I would fish in between classes, I would go fish after class. I would go fish. I would leave, leave on the weekend, drive up the Poudre Canyon, sleep in my car, fish from wow. Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, come back Sunday morning from fishing, mm-hmm. go to class and then go to work and fit. Like I just, it was just something I like couldn't stop figuring out. Uh, and I, I still do. I still love it. I still love being, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm not bad at it. I'm pretty, pretty good at it. But uh, I, now I saltwater fly fish. So I get to go fish in the ocean and stuff. And I'm, that's like a whole new level of it. And I'm bad at that. So it's, it's been like almost uh yeah, almost 10 years, 10 years of me fly fishing and being able to travel to some pretty remarkable places and meet some meet some phenomenal people and find some good community. That's awesome. Speaking of saltwater fishing, you mentioned before we started recording that you had a, <laughs> a incident with your phone, saltwater fishing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My my phone, my old phone uh, is in the bottom of a of a canal outside of Florida Keys on <laughs> Key West. I it was my birthday last weekend and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to, I had shows in Key West. So I was going to do shows in Key West and I was going to go fly fish for permit and tarpon and bonefish and some other saltwater species. And so I was like, what a perfect day. So it was like the day before my birthday, I was like, I'm going to go fishing. And we're in like this small little skiff. It's really shallow. And we're like behind these two shrimp boats. And like, we were coming around this corner and we got stuck in like the waves of the shrimp boats that kind of collided and the nose of the boat went down. And so the nose of the boat went down, we kind of went forward and then it kind of tipped us to the side and I got like ejected out of the boat. And I had like my fishing rod in one hand and my phone in the other hand. Cause I was like, I, I was like taking videos and I think I was taking videos and photos. And so then I like hit the water and I'm like sitting there and I'm like, oh shoot. And I like, I'm like my, I like, and like treading water and he comes back and like pulls me into the boat and I'm like scars all over and like my elbows bruised and my back is like hurting and I'm like my phone and I'm I'm having a baby in May and so I like have all these like maternity photos and like photos of the ultrasound and I was like I gotta find my phone and so like we like drove around and this is where the joke comes from actually because we're driving around and I, I was treading water and I'm a great swimmer I'm like a dolphin but I was treading water and um when I, when we get back in the boat, the guy goes, Oh, it's not that deep. It's like, it's like five and a half feet. It's like six feet. And I was like, I'm six, three dog. (laughs) And I wasn't touching the bottom. So that's where the joke came from. Like, that's where I had the idea for the joke on the boat. Even though I just lost my phone, my brain goes, that don't make no fucking sense. (laughs) (laughs) So that's where the joke come from. But yeah, my phone is in the, in the bottom of the key. So then I had to go to T-Mobile. He, and it was so, we like couldn't find the phone. I'm like cold. He's like, it's like a moment of like two minutes of silence and he just goes, so do you still want to fish? <laughs> I was like, no, I don't want to fish. Even though I really, really wanted to fish because I love permit and tarpon that much. But I was like, no, I don't want to fish. I want to go back and dry and get a phone and do all the shit I got to do. Yeah. So, yeah. Was your wife pissed when you lost all those photos? <laughs> no, because she has everything. Okay. Yeah. It, I just, I, I, I used to have a Samsung and then I, but out of peer pressure from my friends, I got an iPhone and I was yeah. like, I'm not putting anything on the cloud. I thought I was edgy. I thought I was a bad boy. I was like, I'm not putting anything on the cloud. I don't want the government to know what I got going on. Yeah. Like they can't look anyway. Uh, and but she has like all those pictures and stuff. So it wasn't that big of a deal. There was like some videos and stuff that I took that I never backed up on my computer. But uh, yeah, it's 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 just a phone. Everybody was safe and. Uh, 
yeah, yeah. it's fine. Are you on iCloud now? I, I am. I'm working on it. My friend, <laughs> my friend texted me today, and I was like, hey, can you send me that picture I sent you last week? And he was like, only if you promise to turn on my iCloud. So I turned it on. I don't know if anything is uploaded or updated yet. Yeah. So I still, I still sometimes I still feel old because I'm like, Samsung's don't. I don't know. I just plug it into my computer, and it all goes on there. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, I want to talk more about fly fishing. For me, one of the challenges is, like, knowing all of the details to be able to catch a fish in a particular area like i know how to go to a fly fishing store and get some flies i don't know if anything is correct for the area yeah i don't know the right time to fish yeah uh, how do you get all of this beta is this from talking at, to people at the fisherman shops are you doing research online is it when you go fishing with people like they're sharing their intel how does that work i would i would say all the all the above i mean when i first started fishing um Every I just Googled everything. I just Googled, um, for instance, the Poudre River was my home river. That's, like, where I started fly fishing. So I would just Google Poudre River flies. And I would just look. And then a website would come up and be like, hey, here's the top ten flies for the Poudre River. Mm -hmm. And then I would go to the fly shop. And I'd be like, hey, I'm going to the Poudre River. They say I should use these flies. What do you guys think? And they're like, oh, some of these are good. I'm going to give you a couple of these ones. These ones have been working. And then... Then you go out and you see like, okay, those flies worked or maybe fish looked at the flies, but they didn't eat it. And then when then when you go out with people, especially if they are better anglers than you or they know a little bit more, you can, I always ask questions. I'm always like, well, why, why did you do that? Or why do you think the fish did that? Or why are you casting over there and not over there? And so then you sort of learn like, okay, during the summer, fish hang out in this part and they may eat the same flies they do during the winter, but they may just eat them bigger because there's more food during the summer. So they like bigger stuff or during the winter, they like smaller stuff or stuff that's more natural colored or drab, like, you know, your grays, your browns. Cause during the winter stuff isn't, stuff isn't growing. It's not eating that much colorful food. And then during the summer stuff is bigger and flying around and stuff. So I, that's how I sort of did it. It was like, look online, go to the fly shop. And even, you know, sometimes fly shops are like, they're not going to give you the best secrets, but they still have to sell stuff. So they're going to be mm -hmm. like, here's a couple of things you can try and then try it and then even go back to the flash and be like, that shit didn't work at yeah. all. <laughs> Send me the stuff that worked. Give yeah. show me the back closet of all the secret flies. Are you reluctant to share your best tips? Because I imagine there's a sense of like not wanting to share your secret spot. And secret yeah. Sauce with other people. Yeah. There's, and there's a bit of gatekeeping and I have mixed feelings about gatekeeping because part of me is like, I want to protect the resource, but then I'm like, well, who the fuck am I to to protect the resource like it's not mine to begin with mm -hmm. i i'm fishing on someone else's property i'm fishing on someone else's land like who, what am i so but i also still want to protect stuff to a point where like other people can still enjoy it or it stays like as as it is so um yeah i i, I will gladly share tips and i you know i i run a bunch of community fly fishing events through an organization called brown folks fishing mm -hmm. Um, and I work with schools and I take students out and I, I tell them like whatever, whatever question they have, I'll tell them because I'm like, I don't want I don't want to have any barrier for you to say like you can't do this because I want if, as as bad as it would be for the environment. I've, if everyone fly fish, I feel like we would, we would have a lot more protected spaces. We would have like a lot more cleaner water because people are like, oh, I want to go do that thing where there's fish that are healthy and happy. So, yeah, I, I share tips. I share ideas. Only thing I only thing I won't share is like flies i mean not not flies i'll share flies uh only thing i won't share is um is like uh if someone gives me a fly and they go like hey this is mm. this is the magic classified yeah then i go cool this magic stays with me yeah. you know but if someone if someone <clears throat> like is out of shop and they go that's a good fly don't like not that many people are using it then i'll buy a couple and i'll give them to friends or if i go fish with someone i'm like hey you can have these like mm. if, if they help you catch fish whatever um and also there's a couple of there's a couple of spots where i f i personally like worked to find that i looked on like maps i looked on hiking apps i looked on hunting apps i looked on google earth that i like went and found that have like remarkable fish and then i'm like well i did the work to do that so i'm not gonna share it now if i ran into someone they're like hey i uh i don't know why i want to tell you this but i found the fishing spot and i'm like oh what's the, where's your fish and it happens to be the same spot i'll be like cool i can we can talk about it because we know but that though that's the only thing where i'm like that's what i don't share because it's like i worked to get that to that spot i worked to find it and it's 
there's so much information that you could find a lot of spots um, that people try to hide and stuff, but it's just like, I, oh, that's the only thing where I'm like, ah, I, I can't, I can't tell you that. I just, yeah. I'll have to kill you if I tell you that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, <clears throat> when you talk about not sharing like a good type of fly, um, is that because if the fish have too many of this type of fly, it's like when you overeat, like I had sushi five nights in a row, I'm kind of burnt out on it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's usually, it's usually when you go to areas that get fished a lot. So it's usually areas where the, uh, mostly guides, like they're taking people out on the water and, you know, part of their money is that people have to catch fish. And so let's say, uh, let's just say, uh, a guide like ha- he's thrown like a purple skittle, and the fish are all eating the purple skittle. And someone else is that com- a real thing? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, and someone else comes up, and you know they're like, "Oh, what are you throwing?" And he's probably like, "Oh, just like some red and brown skittles." Like he's like, and they, it, may, it may be close to what the fish are eating, but for some reason, for on that day, those fish really, really like purple. And fish are weird like that. Like some days. You could throw a purple, and they 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 will swim from a, across the river to eat it, um, and then the next day they may not like purple. So there's just there's just, especially in pressured areas where people fish a lot, there's just flies that may be just like a little bit better than other flies that people may not want to share because they're like, I have to take clients out. Like I I need to like make a living with that, which I which I understand. Um, but also, uh, fish, their, fish, their their diet is so varied. It's they're never just like, oh, we're only eating this one exact thing right now for the next four weeks or whatever. So there there comes a little bit of variability in that. But um, it it can be like like the South Platte River that goes through Deckers, uh, Deckers, Colorado. Um, those fish get fished three hundred and. 90 days a year 25 hours a day eight days a week like they just those fish are always getting fish so there's a couple of flies where you're like oh man these are these are the flies that usually work and it's a tailwater which means that it stays at a consistent temperature all year round like the flows may go up or down but it stays pretty regulated because it's coming out of a dam so the water's coming out of a dam it's not like a natural um river cycle and so those fish they get food and they get fed every day everything so those fish if you've been eating every day your entire life you're not gonna yeah (laughs) (laughs) which is good yeah i encourage you to eat every day your entire life i'll continue to do so uh but you're not gonna be you're just gonna be like oh i don't have to i don't have to walk all the way over there to get food i can food will show up here in a a second Mm -hmm. so uh then there's there's a couple of flies that I that I use in Deckers, but and it's usually not a color or anything. It's usually size. So usually, if I go smaller on the flies, the fish are like, yeah, we're more willing to eat it because oh. it's just it's just smaller. But that's like my tip for Deckers is like I always just go smaller. But then you hear guys say like, oh, I have this one magic fly that works every single time. It's like that's just not true. They're that's just fucking with you. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. just there's just not there's just not true. It seems like to be good at fly fishing, it is predominantly a knowledge game, right? Like you have to know the correct fly, the correct locations. Is how much of it is actually a skill element, like being able to cast well? And um, I guess I don't even know what skills. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. is that it? Yeah, I mean that's a great that's a great question. I I will say it's probably more, from my perspective, it's probably more lucky than it is skill. Okay. Because so I mean some days you can just some days you can show up and you can be at the right spot with the right flies and the those fish because of the way the temperature of the water is or because of the pressure system in the air like those fish may not be in that section of river yet or if you go the very next day or maybe the sun comes out and someone walks up you an hour after you and they're like i pulled 30 fish out of that hole and you're like there were no fish in there and it's just like it's just how it goes so i would say it is knowledge based, but it's also just like you can gather as much knowledge as possible. But Mother Nature kind of she still ha- has her own say in her way with things of like, well, you know, I'm going to make sure that the f- the fish don't show up like the, usually the fish show up beginning of March for like I went down to Florida to, sh- to look for tarpon. Usually the fish show up beginning of March and they're like, well, we've had a weird weather week where it was, the water was so cold that the fish haven't showed up yet and i was like 
so that I knew the knowledge. I had all the flies. I've called them before. I know how to cast. I know how to do these things, but the fish just weren't there. Yeah. Um, and with, with trout, it's a little more contained because it's just in a river. But with runoff, those fish can go upstream, downstream, um, stuff like that. I would say, yeah, probably the the biggest skill of fly fishing, and I, I, if you're listening to this, I want you to know, like, fly fishing comes off as pretentious, but anyone can do it. Like, it is way easier than people give it credit for. I think people try to make it seem like, I'm not pay, people make try to make it seem like it is seemed like it's like a pretentious, fancy, hard thing. It, I promise you, it's not. You just have to go fish with the right people. Like I. My favorite fishing is when I take naps. So, like, that's my favorite fly fishing days. Yeah. Of like, if I could take a nap on the water, <laughs> that's a good day. But the biggest skill is probably casting. Like, mm-hmm. it's the biggest curve to learning is, like, can you cast a fly rod? Because if you can't put the flies where the fish are, then they're not going to eat it, yeah. right? So that's that's the biggest, like, skill thing. And just, you know, stand in the backyard. or I go to the park with my dog, and I just cast. I just cast mm-hmm. as far as I can. I will put my hat over there and try to hit my hat and stuff like that. That's probably the biggest skill thing. Um, and then there's, there's just little stuff like, you know, learning knots. There's like maybe one or two knots you need to know when you start first start fly fishing. Uh, yeah, knots and like tying on flies. But other than that, it's just like go out there and fail at it. It's not something I – don't, I don't want people to look at fly fishing and be like, oh, I have to catch like the biggest fish. It's like, no, like go stand – in the river where there's oxygen all around you and cool your feet off and listen to the river and uh, listen to the birds. I love looking at birds on the water. So that's, yeah. So Mm -hmm. the biggest skill is probably casting though. That's probably the biggest jump. You mentioned towards the beginning of the fish talk, like this carp that was going towards the fly and then turned away and decided not to go for it. And you were thinking to yourself, why did that happen? Right. Mm -hmm. I want to figure this out. I, for me, I'm seeing parallels between that and your comedy where it's you like have a crowd and the fish in this case is the crowd and something's working or it's <clears> not working and you want to figure out why did that work this time and it didn't work this time. You know, do you think that this is a hobby that does particularly well with the type of person who likes to tinker with things, who likes to workshop things? Because that's where I'm seeing similarities. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is definitely like a um, I call it pu- I call it puzzle pieces. Like you're always trying to like f- make you're always trying to like get to the end goal of like whether it's catching the fish, whether it's getting people to laugh. But you're like taking this piece and going like, okay, it doesn't fit here, it works, or it does fit here and it works. And I yeah, I, that's a great thing. I I kind of equate flies as like jokes, and like the crowd is the audience. You know the the scenery is the club or the venue where the show is at. So you can kind of say like. Yeah, you can you can cast you can cast as many flies, you can throw as many jokes out, and sometimes the crowd just doesn't like, like sometimes fish just aren't going to eat it. And then sometimes you can like be walking up the river and you're just like dragging your rod with your fly in the water and the fish will come up and grab it and you're like, "Man, I'm kind of good at this." And like it's <laughs> sometimes you say a joke and you just you just say something and the crowd laughs and you go, "Man, I'm very funny." Like so it it is very much just like a and always like a uh, why like how do i figure it out like what's the next thing what how do i figure it out how do i figure it out um which is fun it's a it's a fun thing to always be like okay the the tarpon didn't show up this time but why okay but they didn't show up because of the weather so next time i'll look at the weather and say maybe they'll show up if it's warmer and now i know like okay they like warmer water that makes sense because they can also breathe oxygen you're like okay so you start putting the pieces together and now i'm like I left going like, all right, next year I'm going to come back maybe like two weeks later so it's a little less shoulder season and maybe it'll be a little warmer, tarpon starts showing up or uh, stuff like that. So it is very like I'm always I'm always just like, well, 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 why why did they laugh or why didn't they laugh? Like what was that funny? Why did they eat that fly or was that fly moving too much or was it not deep enough? Like it's, yeah. So that's a great comparison because – do you keep notes for the fishing stuff? Like no, that's I'm now I'm really afraid of the government to take all my. <laughs> no, I it's all it's all in it's all in my head. I do have like photos, and it's so weird because I I can't sometimes I can't remember date nights I have with my lady, but I I can like I can look at a picture and be like I know how many fish I caught, I know what I was using, I know where I was like I can I can like go back and just be like, 
I know. I remember. I have collected all this data in my brain to be like, I I can make this work. I'm like sure that makes her feel good. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's never a point of contention ever in our no. <laughs> conversation. She's like, do you remember that one time? And I'm like, no. But she's like, do you remember that one time we went fishing? I'm like, absolutely. And <laughs> the fish came. Yeah, and I you it was purple and it was like a little bit windy and it was choppy. Yeah, I remember. And it was like 30 degrees a couple of days before. Yeah, and so walking into a fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so it it is. Uh, I, I don't keep anything written down, but I do. I take photos of w- fish or the nature, and I like put it in a folder, and I just like have all the. I just I just have my memory, which is crazy because I have a pretty bad memory when it, except when it comes to f- fishing. I just mm. something about it just makes. I don't know something about it just like makes sense, especially in terms of like I love conservation. I love nature. Like it all just like. I started studying wildlife biology kind of after I started fly fishing. And once I started fly fishing, like all my grades, like one, once I started studying wildlife biology and fly fishing, all my grades went up. Cause it was just like, I was outside. I didn't plants, I didn't birds looking at habitat management, looking at restoration work. Cause it was like, I was doing, I was outside with a thing while I was fishing and trying to piece all together and being like, there's a lot of ospreys and bald eagles here. So there must be a healthy fish population. Cause all they eat is fish. So it's just like, I don't know. I'm. I get like super nerdy about stuff like that. <laughs> and you, go ahead. You mentioned working with <laughs> an organization called Brown Folks Fishing, and we talked before the show about you doing some work with Black Packers. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you do with these organizations and why their work matters? Yeah, I just i i want i want to i want to create a i i always say I want to create a safe space for people to explore nature. So I want people to show up and not feel like, oh, I can't do this. I'm not allowed to do this. Because when I first started fly fishing, I was looking just for people who looked like me or who came from my background or who just weren't like rich, rich people. And I was like, well, I wasn't, I'm not a rich person. I wasn't a rich kid. Like I was exposed to stuff, but it's like, I I didn't know what fly fishing was until I was in college. And I had met people and they're like, yeah, I've been fly fishing since I was like six years old. And that was so foreign to me so stuff like black packers and stuff like brown folks fishing is just trying to create a safe space for anyone to show up and say hey i i have a question i think it's stupid and i go trust me no question is stupid if you want to learn like ask me any question and i'll answer it about fly fishing or or nature or or whatever or whatever it is and so um groups like black uh black packers and brown folks fishing they they create a they create a space for especially people of color to to feel welcomed into a community that they may have not felt welcomed before um and i i try to facilitate that by just saying like i I, i'm silly i'm just like i don't take it seriously because i'm like i don't want someone to come in and be like oh man you have to be like kind of an asshole to do this i'm like no you can just be a normal goofy guy who really had no had no plans of doing this in his life but i like i i love it so it's just like a create trying to create a safe space for people to explore whatever they want to explore and that is not only you know fishing and backpacking but whether that's you know hiking or hunting or foraging i'm not that big in the foraging i wish i was and i'm trying to get better at it. i'm going to try to get better at it this summer but if someone comes up and they go like hey i really want to get into foraging at a fishing event i go well i know some people who are very welcoming and who are going to say like they're not going to you know keep that gate closed they're going to be like oh come learn with us and come hang out and i i love groups like that and anything i can do to support them uh, i will or create events or opportunities for people to for do stuff like that i just yeah, I, I, like I treat fishing like I treat comedy. Like it should be fun. It should be fun. You shouldn't. I don't want to be like the little kid I was on the bucket at five o'clock in the morning telling my papa like this sucks. <laughs> like this, I want to be like no. I had a fun time. I took a nap today. I got some, you know, I got some fish. Got some sunshine. Got some good laughs. So, if <clears throat> somebody listening to this, you know, was interested in fly fishing and wanted to break into the sport but didn't know where to start what do you recommend? Like what's the most basic equipment that you need? And then like, yeah. how do you get started finding the right water source? Yeah. Um, I, I will first off and say, I don't believe fly fishing is a sport. Okay. Cause I activity. think that, yeah, I think it's an activity. Uh, and I define a sport and we can have a conversation about this, but I define a sport as someone trying to physically stop you from something like someone's <laughs> ding you up or at like a physical limitation yeah. of your body. Like I would put 
back it back. Like that boat wanted to I, uh, <laughs> <rent> you <laughs> to stop me. For, it was pretty good. It stopped me for the day. Yeah. Uh, I would even put like extreme backpacking or like long distance backpacking more of a sport than fly fishing because that's like the physical limitation of your body. Like you're carrying your more than your weight and like walking a long distance. Fly fishing, you just standing next to a river waving a stick yeah, around yeah uh but i get into many arguments with people who say well it, do you guys think chess is a sport uh i, no. I would put that under activity but it's someone stopping you <clears throat> yeah but there's no physical exertion a sport in my mind has physical exertion yeah i think there's got to be an athletic component to it for it to be a sport in my mind i don't know why i'm trying to think of any exceptions to this very arbitrary rule that I no i think of. i'm going firm on there has to be a physical yeah. exertion but well, I, did, I did refer to fly fishing as a sport and aside from just going like that yeah it's really not that much of an athletic endeavor yeah i would put golf in more of a sport than i would fly fishing because you can get injured playing golf because you're i mean you're breaking your back you're you're doing like sure. superhuman stuff sort of to yeah. hit a ball Fly fishing, you just, I'm just like, you're just waving the stick. Okay, yeah. that's my thing. <laughs> if anybody wants to argue, please argue with me. I like it. Uh, yeah, when you first get into fly fishing, the the especially if you're in Colorado or in any mountain town, Montana, Idaho, even California, if you're not fishing the ocean, you can usually get a nine foot five weight rod, and nine feet is the length, and then five weight is just like sort of the the size of fish you can catch so it's not it doesn't really equate to like pounds or size or like actual physical number of a fish but five weight you can catch like trout some small carp you can go bass fishing it's like you can it's very widely used to do like a lot of different type of fishing the lower you go on weights the smaller the fish you can catch so you're not going to catch the same fish on a five weight that you would do like a one weight because the one weight rod would snap because the five weight fish is too big. So you're just catching minnows with a one weight. Yeah, one weight you're going like little brook trout, like oh. little high alpine brook trout that are like the size of your hand or like this is gonna sound bad, but like goldfish out of like small ponds that you see, like you can catch like super small fish like that. Um, and then as you go up in weights, like in Florida, we took ten weights and eleven weights to go catch, you know, eighty pound, hundred pound fish, Damn. seventy pound fish. Because so the bigger you go in weight, the bigger you get in fish. But usually a nine foot five weight is all you need. What's um, the biggest weight? The biggest weight is like a fourteen weight. Okay. And you're catching like striped marlin. You're catching like tuna on the fly. You're catching stuff that like is the fastest swimming stuff in the yeah. ocean. You're like fishing off a boat. Does that go into sport territory? Because yes. I assume then that's physical exertion. Yes. I feel like once you get to saltwater fly fishing, it becomes a sport. Okay. Because I, I hooked into a tarpon that was like 120, 130 pounds. And it took me like an hour and a half to reel it in. Really? And I'm, I like was stripping off clothes. I was like sweating. <laughs> I like got into the water and this fish wasn't even tired. And I was like, I might pass out. Like I... <laughs> The, like the fish whoop my ass so i look at that as a sport because you're fighting fish that weigh as much as you or more and they're trying to kill you like they're angry that you got that they got caught and they are trying to get out of there so i, I would see that saltwater extreme fly fishing as a sport okay uh but you need nine foot five weight um and you can get those at like my first rod was from cabela's bass pro shop and it was like it probably is a little more expensive now, but it was like 89 bucks, and you got a rod, a reel that went with it. You have five-weight line that went with it and leader and tippet, and then all that just connects to the fly. And then they give you like a couple of flies in there, like three or four. Those flies don't ever actually do shit, but you can go to a fly shop and ask for flies and spend 30 bucks, 20 bucks on a, on a bunch of flies. Um, so that that's all you need to get started. And I would say, you know, before you even – go fishing like go to your backyard go to a park or something and just go cast go cast the rod look up youtube videos on how to like put the line through the guides like through the holes on the fly rod to pull it out the top to be able to cast and then after that just go practice and get comfortable and and then um if you can find a community group like brown folks fishing community fishing to like go fish with um you could pay a guide that's always an option to pay a guy to say like, you know, usually it's like 
four hundred dollars for a full day, five hundred bucks for a full day. Split it with someone or something, and then you know go with the guide, and they'll tie on they'll tie on all the flies, and they'll do all the stuff for you. So you can just stand there and wave the stick, but you can tell them like, hey, I want to learn how to fly fish, so I'm like, I'm go- I'm going with you to like learn fly fishing, and they'll teach you like this is the knot we're using, these are the flies we're using, this is why we. If they're a good guide, they'll teach you like what this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. So. Um, but really all you need is a nine foot five weight from Cabela's Bass Pro. There's like a bunch of cheap ones. I, I had a cheap one for like three or four years. And the only reason that I don't have it anymore is just cause I slammed it in my car. Wind- like I put it in my car door and then the wind blew and it just like snapped in a half. So oh. it was completely my fault. But, um, you just get one of those setups, go and practice and then just go fish and you don't have to go all the way to Vail. You don't have to go all the way down to the sp- – like, you don't have to go to the magical places to go fish. You can just go fish to, like, get the fishing license and go fish at Sloan's Lake. Like, go fish at City Park. And there's bass in there. There's trout in there. Um, go to – something I do is I look up when – I. this is a secret for you fly fishing people. So go to, you can go to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife website, and they have two things. They have a fishing atlas where you can click the fishing atlas, and you can type in, like, rainbow trout and it will show you all the places in Colorado where there's rainbow trout you can and it'll show you like is it a river is it a lake is it easy to get to is it hard to get to like it has everything about fishing I also go to Colorado Parks and Wildlife CPW stocking report on like a Christmas stocking like stocking report and it'll it'll tell you when Colorado Parks and Life stocks lakes Mm -hmm. or stocks rivers so it'll say like what's today March March 6th it'll say like March 7th CPW stocked 10,000 rainbow trout into this lake. Then on March 8th, you could go there and fish and catch one of those fish that they stocked because there's abundance of fish in there and sort of learn the skill of, like, casting. And that way you know, like, there are fish in here, so whatever I'm doing, I can figure out what I need to do. Um, do the recently stocked areas tend to attract more people? K- uh, kind of. Uh, you know, some of the spots are, like, popular spots that people go fish at saturday and sunday mornings when it's nice out Mm -hmm. you know uh some of the spots are just spots where they just they'll stock them into um cherry creek reservoir they'll stock them into um smaller lakes or staunton state park or whatever so you can you can some of the places are like places where saturday morning people are getting up it's their weekend and they're going to fish some of the places are um just reservoirs that not that many people go to or not that many people are, are especially fly fishing for a lot of people fish probably not a lot of people are fly fishing for and you can look up the locations you can look up how many they stocked you can look up what species they stocked so that's what i always tell people because i'm like if you really want to catch fish whether you want to eat them or not eat them you can go there and then you get a pretty good tool of like okay i'm using the right flies or i caught a fish or stuff like that it'll give you a pretty good like based on like yeah we caught fish our first time you know and then after that go keep doing that whenever you get a chance but go explore new water and new places and try to meet people and ask questions do you do exclusively catch and release if yes for the most part most of the fishing i do is catch and release um we caught a barracuda in florida we kept it um gave it to some guys uh usually the only time i'm i'm not catching and releasing is one and if it's of an if it's an invasive species that whatever agency says we want those out of there, mm. then sometimes we'll eat them. Sometimes we'll just kill them. Mm. Um, like there's a section of the Colorado river that has pike in it that, uh, an agency was like, we don't want pike in it. So they actually like, well, they'll get like, we'll give you $20 a head. Oh wow. If you bring the head yeah. to like us. Yeah. And so we're, we're fishing for pike. And, you know, some sometimes we're like, if a fish is, like, really pretty, I have a soft spot, and I go, you're too pretty to kill, you know? Like a serial killer. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. like a reverse serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> too pretty to kill. And then sometimes <clears throat> it's just like uh, I'll, I fished a small creek, and the creek had a brook trout in it, and it was only supposed to have a type of cutthroat, one of the native population of cutthroat in Colorado. And so um, we kept all the brook trout we killed and there was even a bald eagle that was flying around so we like threw a pile and the bald eagle came and like grabbed a bunch of fish and flew away uh which i don't know that seems like i shouldn't be doing that but uh 
if if we're like camping or backpacking or like having like overnight trips, then then we'll kill fish and eat them and harvest. We'll harvest them and then eat them and make fish tacos because those are delicious to have. Yeah. Uh, Do you have a favorite fish to eat, at least here in Colorado. Probably brook trout. Brook trout are really good, and they they live in such high altitude places and usually the water they live in is really clean so the meat's always really clean but um yeah catch a fish gut it clean it harvest it and then put it in fish tacos but then you know five minutes is or put it in the fire within five minutes is pretty pretty spot on with some beans rice Mm -hmm. tomatoes to my understanding is it's something like 25 percent of fish that are catch and release end up dying yes what's the skill to de-hooking it to ensure that it lives well there's a couple things even before you start before you start fishing like one is debarbing the hook so all all most hooks and there's some there's some hook companies are actually like not even putting barbs on their hook but the barb is just the backward facing needle on the hook so when you debarb it that just means you're pinching it down because when you when you have it barbed and you hook a fish as that fish is like whether if it's deep and it's like against its tongue or back in its throat or even if it's just on its cheek as that fish is like trying to get off it's just ripping it's Mm -hmm. just ripping gills flesh whatever it is it's just ripping where if it's un if it's debarbed whatever it is it's just staying there in place it's like an ear piercing or a nose piercing like Mm -hmm. it's just staying in place and then once you pull it out um it's like easy to pull out because it's not barbed so if you ever try to pull out a barb and it's like it gets stuck on like your shirt or you have something and it just gets stuck on and it's just like tearing the fabric and then um usually when people do that they're like with good intention they're trying to take the barbed hook out and they're just like yanking and pulling Mm -hmm. in every different direction it's just it's gonna kill the fish and Mm -hmm. i i think flying girls go like no all my fish swim away fine it's like that's just not true because you pretty much pulled this fish out. You're squeezing it to like make sure it doesn't move. So it's just like, uh, and it's not. You're holding it out of the water for a minute, thirty seconds, whatever it is. Um, so that's one thing you do is like debarb your hooks. Like if you don't plan on eating fish, then there's no reason you should have a barb on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, another thing is like when you when you net it, um, you net it and you keep it in the water for as long. as Like if you want to get a picture of it whatever that looks like you keep it in the net and you keep the net in the water so it stays oxygenated it has oxygen and then you lift it out and i usually teach this to my students i'm like i want you to hold your breath when you pull that fish out of the water i want you to hold your breath for as long as you can and then that's what the fish is feeling like so if you pull a fish out for a picture and you're like holding your breath and you go oh no i should take a breath i need to breathe that fish is also like i would like to breathe also so that's something i teach my kids to say like Hey, when we think about how to handle fish, we want to be like, if we can't breathe, the fish can't breathe. Mm-hmm. So, um, the the if you can like hold a fish near the water and just like barely lift it up, so that way if it flops out of your hand or whatever, it falls right back in the water. But if you hold it lifted up and it's like one, two, three, four, five, then that fish should be swimming away. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you want, need to get another picture, uh, you know, put it back in the water, leave it for a second, one, two, three, four, back in the water. So. Mm-hmm. There, there's stuff to like mitigate that but i think fly anglers like to think like oh all the fish i catch swim away but it's just not true you're stabbing a animal in the face yeah and then holding it out of the water and most of the anglers i fish with don't even take pictures of it catch the fish put in the net go man that's a pretty fish and then just let it go and mm-hmm. that fish is gone um also another thing is wet your hands because fish have like a protective slime they have like a protective coat over them and when you have just dry hands, when you just grab them, you're just pulling all that slime off them. So sometimes places like Decker's, North Platte, that gets fished all day, every day, you can actually see like where someone was wearing gloves or you can see someone's like handprint on the fish because that area molds. Mm-hmm. And so the places that the person wasn't holding has the slime, so it's protecting it. But the place that the person was holding, all that slime is gone. So you can like see the fingerprint of the molds on fish Mm -hmm. and you can like see them in the water or if they get caught again you can like it's like this weird it's not like it's like a wet fuzzy thing Mm -hmm. and it's a mold that's like killing the fish because it's like a bacteria that's in the water that usually they have protection against but they don't because you have Mm -hmm. the slime so before you touch a fish i always tell students like 
dip your hands in the water, rub it on the rocks in the water, like get as wet as you can. That way when you hold the fish, it might be a little slippery, but I'd rather the fish slip out of your hands than you you taking off that protective slime for them. Yeah. So. Would it be right. useful to use gloves or would gloves also strip it? No, it well, it depends on what gloves. Mm-hmm. Like winter gloves or like leather gloves, it's going to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. But um, a lot of people will wear latex gloves, which is great. But I, I, I've tried to use the latex glove, but it just makes, to me, it just makes it more slippery. And I just, the fish is going to flop out anyway. And I was like, I was rather get my, and I, I look at it as like a respect thing. I go, well, I, I'm, I'm going to touch this fish because like I did all this work to catch it. What am I going to be like, ew, I don't want to touch it. But I also latex glove. I see a lot of people during the winter when it's cold to keep their hands dry. They'll do uh, a, like a winter glove with a latex glove. And then when they catch the fish, they'll take off their winter glove, hold it, take a picture, whatever, or release it with the latex glove and then put their glove back in their uh, mitten or whatever to keep their hands warm. Cause once your hands get wet, it's freezing. But mm. Um, yeah. Sweet. Super informative. <clears throat> I, I could talk fishing stuff all day the same way I could talk <laughs> comedy stuff all day, but uh, we're already over our allotted time for this interview. So um, <clears throat> I think we'll put a bow on it and then move to the Patreon. Sweet. Uh, Elon, let people know where they should go to get more from you, uh, your website and the show and all that good stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Elon Strip. I don't know why I'm reintroducing myself. My name is Elon Strip. Like, uh, you can find me on social media at uh, Black Steve Irwin. That's my Instagram. And I think TikTok. I, I don't know if I'm on TikTok. I think I'm on TikTok. My Instagram and my TikTok. And then my website is elonstribbling.com. Um, that's where you can find, like, show dates. And then during the summer, we post. That's where we post, like, community fly fishing stuff. So um, there's, like, a comedy tab where you can watch comedy videos and see where my shows are at. And then there's a fishing tab where you can come and join in on one of those fishing days um, this summer. That We'll have the schedule out by the end of this March of what we're doing this summer. Um, and I also work with the Brown folks fishing and a group called Wanderland um, that does guided trips with people. That's very like low key. We just want people to learn and feel comfortable. So um, those are the two places I'll be, I'll be hanging out fishing this summer. So those are, those are all the places you can find me. And I love cookies. I love cookies <laughs> so much. So if you are inclined and want to bake me cookies and bring them to a show, I think that would be lovely. That Best Girl Scout cookie? Trefoils, the plain mm. ones, the ones in the light blue box, and people always give me shit about it. But yeah. I'm like, I'm an old, I'm an old soul. Yeah, you it's know? like a butter cookie, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just the, it's just a plain yeah. like butter. It, it, it has no character. It has yeah. no flavor. It's just like the, the, like your grandma pulls out a box of cookies. That's yeah. what she's rocking. What about you guys? What's your favorite cookie? Oh, they <clears> have those new s'more ones. The oh, small yeah. ones. The small ones are, are so good. Honestly, that was going to be my pick. They're delicious. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, they're fantastic. I We went to, right before I started the Foothills Trail hike, I was at Blue Blaze Brewing, and there was a girl with a booth selling Girl Scout cookies. And I was like, oh, I'll pack out some of these for a trail. That'd I'll get great. a box, but yeah. we'll eat some while we're all here yeah. so that I don't have that many to pack out. Yeah. I went home with no cookies. <laughs> we ate every single fucking cookie. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. That's a sign of a good cookie. Yeah. For sure. Oh, strong That's a sign cookie. of a solid cookie. My runner-up is the Samoa. And I don't even like shaved uh, coconut. coconut. I think typically it's gross, but for some reason, like it just makes the texture of the it cookie. It works. Yeah, it's perfect. I respect it. Yeah. I mean, it, it says a lot about you, but I respect <laughs> it. <laughs> Uh, well, awesome. This was a ton of fun. Thank you for doing this. And if you want more from Elon, uh, we're going to do the Patreon episode right now. To the Trek propaganda portion of today's show, the first one I want to hit on, uh, obviously we've talked about this quite a bit in the past, the 2024 Badger sponsorship is a wrap. And together we raised a little over $22,000 for Leave No Trace. Very happy about that. Thank you to everyone who got involved and donated any amount of money. Um, congratulations to the 15 winners who got the amazing prize packages. I've been privy to all of their responses and uh, without fail, everyone shits their pants when they get that email saying that they've gotten about $2,000 worth of gear. So uh, lots of winners involved here, but the biggest winner of them all is Leave No Trace. Uh, very excited to do this again next year. And if by chance you are a brand listening to this podcast and you'd like to get involved, you can reach out to me at podcast at the track.co. Um, I'm going to skip the second one in the interest of time. I've got a hot date. Question of the day. Mm-hmm. In five words or less, start a fight without politics. This is one of those hard ones because I remember having adamant opinions about this when I sent it. Yeah. And I'm going to make you go first because I'm trying to remember what I thought. There's a note here. Is there? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was the that was the post that prompted the thought, which yeah. is that Pop Tarts are basically ravioli. Is that the one that you're going with? No, but okay. I think that's true. No. In what way is it not? It's a pastry. It's, it's it, there's a center wrapped around other things. That's not the definition of a ravioli. Okay, I agree to disagree. <laughs> What's yours? Uh, also food related is that <clears throat> avocado <clears throat> is overrated. Okay. I feel like avocado toast is like one of the most Instagrammable things that people put when they're eating food. I don't know if people still do that. I'm not active on social media anymore, but once upon a time. And uh, although I do like avocado, it like the hype and demand around it has now made avocado so fucking expensive that it's just, it, I, it's now to the point where it's overrated. It's like, it's got a little bit of flavor. It's, it's fatty. It's got some good nutrition, but um it's kind of whatever, honestly. For the price now, I don't get it that often because it's it's not worth it. Um, I remember mine now, but yeah, I agree with you. Avocado sometimes gives me a tummy ache, and it goes okay. brown very fast. That's true. So it it's oxidizes like, super quickly. You have to, you have to be diligent about your avocado eating. Yeah, if you're gonna eat half of it, you better eat the other half. Within yeah, immediately. Twenty four hours. Maybe that's why I get the tummy ache because I'm like, I've got to eat this sure. whole thing now, and yeah. then it's too much. Yeah, it's like a banana. Like yeah, you take, if you eat half a banana, the rest of that's just going to shit very quickly it's funny because i'll blow like 20 bucks on doordash on something that i could have not spent money on yeah but the idea of throwing out half an avocado or like a piece of food because i didn't eat it before it went bad kills me uh, that's my biggest bummer with the situation too is like yeah if you buy four avocados and you eat two of them you're throwing away three dollars worth of stuff uh, with bananas you get a lifetime supply of bananas for two dollars tip for you though on the if you buy four avocados i've been seeing a lot of this for lemons limes and I recently saw that it works for avocados too. If you put them in a jar of water in your fridge, they'll stay mm. good for like a month. No shit. Yeah. Apparently the flavor is like a little bit like flatter, mm. but they are, you can take them out and they're perfectly good. So people have started storing lemons in jars of water. They've started storing avocados in jars of water. Huh. Um, I knew to take it out of the produce bowl because there's some like gas emitted from the other fruits and vegetables that actually ages it faster but i didn't know that one yeah That's try cool. it let me know okay. um i remember what mine was and yeah. so the the thing is i'm not th i'm not saying this because i believe it this isn't like a, i believe this it's just in five words or less ways to start a fight without sure. politics i think if you were to take someone who likes star wars and say star wars isn't that creative or like it's mm -hmm. not that good of a story yeah um granted this is the world I'm, i live in now is a star wars world yeah. thank you garrett uh, but knowing that you could you could get someone to probably go off on like a 60 minute heated monologue sure. where they're like they don't even leave you room to talk you yeah. know like they just are in defensive i've got to defend this mode and they will go and go and go that brings up a good potential triple crown category we could do like the triple crown of things that are religion that aren't religion or politics mm. like the things that people that get people most aggravated basically like the categories for this cause, yeah yeah like triple crown of cult followings yeah uh star wars would be a good one um like sports teams yeah that, we did this in the patreon episode talking about people's like diets yeah like, people who are hardcore paleo vegan whatever like they defend that shit tooth and, tooth and nail. It's crazy. Yep. I'm, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, got a voicemail. Yay. We were supposed to do this a few episodes ago and didn't get to it. So sorry for letting this sit, Robert. But here it goes. Regarding the triple crown of things not to do while drinking, we left off by probably the most important one, and that is dialing an ex, Ooh. either girlfriend or a wife. Yeah, that's bad. Calling them at 3 a.m. never turns out well, at least not in the long run. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, fun fact. Uh, you know how, like, if you don't remember to delete your voicemails, your voicemail fills up? Mm -hmm. um, that happened to me, as it does everyone, so I went through to go delete them. And I found an ex from college, left me a drunk voicemail, and it's in that list. I still haven't deleted it. He's married now. I have no romantic interest in him, but I think the fact that it's there is yeah. so fucking funny. That is funny. Um, so yeah, don't do that because people like me will 10 years later still have them in their voicemail list because they just think it's funny. Yeah. Do you have a most embarrassing 3 a.m. text to an ex? Well, the problem is I wouldn't remember, yeah. <laughs> would I? Unless they responded. Um, well, 
back in my heyday of binge drinking and making bad decisions, yeah. when the things like that would occur, I would delete them immediately after. Um, but one time, okay, here's one. Uh, one time when I was not the same as calling them, but you'll get the overlap uh, in college. Same ex, actually, same guy. Um, he lived around the corner from where I was living. So a lot of the times after the bars while we were dating, I would just go back to his place. Um, went out one night after we had broken up, um, got hammered at the bars, forgot that we had broken up and that wasn't where I go home to. <laughs> went home to his house, knew where he kept the key because he would lock his bedroom and the house. Is this in Thailand? No, this okay. is in, in Oswego, New York. Okay. Went to his like house that him and his frat brothers lived in, used the spare key to unlock the front door, used where he hid his bedroom key to unlock his bedroom door went in went to sleep woke up at 3 a.m to him standing over me being like what the fuck <laughs> and i didn't remember anything i just remember waking up and being like why is he in my room and like <laughs> looking around and being like this is not my room yeah. um that was a walk of shame that's funny <laughs> yeah the 3 a.m tired walk of shame yeah he was not happy yeah <laughs> he was not happy uh triple crown of shows to fall asleep to easy Okay. Kill more girls, wholesome, nice uh -huh. music, no conflict. Yep. Love it. Uh, I got to find my list here. Okay. Um, I have a whole category, so I'm, I'll just say a few shows, but I think they're all kind of the same. But basically, any of the nature documentaries on Netflix, Ooh, like okay. Our Planet, Our Universe, there's a new one, Wild Babies. Oh. Yeah, just baby animals. Okay. I, I love that. Yeah. yeah, what, yeah. what channel is that on? Netflix. Netflix. Yeah. Wild Babies. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just it's always nice and pleasant until they get to like the yeah the earth is ending part that makes me sad but yeah. uh yeah it's always a nice thing to doze off to okay uh second one is if i'm answering this accurately like the thing that i consume the most as i'm falling asleep this is the answer it's uh a podcast so i'm watching it on youtube it's matt and shane's secret podcast shane gillis is like blowing up right now he just hosted saturday night live uh I've, I've been fanboying for a couple of years, but yeah, I'm often listening to that as I fall asleep. Great. Yeah. Um, Game of Thrones is my next one. I It's one of those that, similar to the Gilmore Girls, I think there's a season that you rewatch it. Gilmore Girls is my fall season to fall asleep to it. Game of Thrones is winter. And is that not too stressful for you? No, because... Because you know I've it's coming. I know it's happening. You can fast forward the Red Wedding. And also... No, I would never. <laughs> um, I know it's coming. So, And I also have seen it so many times that I can close my eyes to fall asleep. Yeah. And still like feel like I'm watching even if I'm not watching. And if I fall asleep and I like don't remember what part I fell asleep at, it's good enough that tomorrow I'll just start the episode over and like mm -hmm. fall asleep to it again. Yeah. Um, so that one will never get old for me. And then the last one I have, what have I been falling asleep to recently? That's not those. Cause it's, you don't want to pick one of your favorite shows because even though you watch it while you're falling asleep, you don't want to fall asleep to it. Oh, Nanalan, bringing that up again. Mm. The little green girl that I talked about that oh, one time, yeah, that yeah, kids yeah, yeah. show, the music. And there are you parts- not like not religiously like i'm not like this isn't weird <laughs> but if you need to fall asleep and you like can't and you need to turn your brain off it's kind of funny the show but it's also like because it's made for kids yeah it puts you to sleep like, there's parts of the show where the woman will take out a storybook and she'll read the girl a story for her to like settle down for her nap and like nana land whatever the girl's name is will fall asleep while she's reading the story but then i'll also fall asleep while she's reading the story yeah um so if i'm desperate like this isn't an every night thing i sure. watch the housewives and like normal people stuff but yeah. if i'm desperate or like a little sad yeah um that's one that i know will do the job yeah uh my last one kind of cheating because it's not a show it's a movie but uh in when i was sick i watched this and fell asleep to it many times primarily because i was bored by it and was wanting to love it, Oppenheimer. Where the bombs go off? I can't talk. I, I actually saw Oppenheimer twice in theaters, and because I saw it already the second time, I really needed a nap, so I slept <laughs> through the whole thing. Yeah. Does the um, bomb go off? Cause I, yeah, it's really loud. I, I, I remember the scene where they tested it. Does, do they actually show either the Japanese? No, the test one. But the yeah. test one is like the whole... Maybe this is because I saw it in theaters. The yeah. whole theater was rumbling. Yeah, it was not an IMAX or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's a funny one to fall asleep to. It's just I'm used to Nolan movies because I would... 
it's possible that Interstellar is my favorite movie of all time, and I love most of his movies. I just was very bored by this one. Yeah, Garrett Garrett's like that too. He likes uh, space movies. Yeah, obviously Star Wars, but he's big on Interstellar and so all good. those. It's Interstellar is m- almost perfect. It might be perfect. Yeah. It's very good. Uh, sweet. Any honorable mentions? Uh, home reno movies or home reno shows like fixer upper mm. flipper flop the treehouse building treehouse masters yeah um uh million dollar listings any of those put me to bed i'll just add <clears throat> jenna's every single night the office yeah like that's a good one every night um, we gotta plug me this is a segment we do infrequently, recurring, however, is past guests send us their current projects, and we're excited to promote Glenn Van Pesky, founder of Gossamer Gear, has released a new book, or I guess it's coming out in a week from this episode, week-ish, uh, titled Take Less, Do More, Surprising Life Lessons in Generosity, Gratitude, and Curiosity from an Ultralight, excuse me, Backpacker. Uh, Glenn's book delves into the principles of minimalism, generosity, gratitude, and curiosity as applied to ultralight backpacking and daily life. He advocates for simplifying possessions to focus on life priorities, emphasizes the enriching practice of generosity, underscores the power of gratitude in fostering personal growth and community connection, and encourages curiosity as a pathway to a fulfilling life. Through anecdotes and practical advice, advice, Glenn illustrates how embracing these principles can lead to a more fulfilling and adventurous existence. I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Glenn's a super interesting dude. We really enjoyed our chat with him. Uh, we'll throw his episode in the show notes. But um, got to say, I haven't had a chance to read the book, but I'm sure it's excellent. Um, I also have a follow up. Yeah. I just this reminded me of it. Um, remember, do you remember the girl that wrote in that one time about how she was about to do the hike with her friend and she thought that like there might be something more there, but she wanted to figure out how to. It sounds old. Is this like a this was old match- matchmaking? It was. It was after that, but she was going to do the AT with a guy that like she wanted something with but didn't want to ruin the hiking dynamic if it wasn't something we talked about it on some episode she followed up with me yesterday um they ended up having a fling it fizzled out but then she did the pinhoti trail and met her current boyfriend on it oh sweet so So if anyone remembers that info here's a call back to that there's love to be found on trail somewhere eventually uh mailbag Howdy, I'm an AT through hiker, Nobo class of 23, and a Foothills Trail through hiker, Weibo class of 23. I'll be through hiking the Sheltowee Trace Trail in Kentucky and Tennessee starting this April, and will be through hiking the West Highland Way in Scotland this summer before starting the PCT in 2025. I plan on completing the Triple Crown after my CDT through hike in 27. I love Backpacker Radio and will be thrilled to call in sometime or be on the show at some point. If you guys ever have any openings like that, please email me anytime. Thanks, Vegas good place to plug our voicemails yeah what is the website um speak pipe i guess so that doesn't do you any good uh it'll be a link in the show notes and if you follow us on instagram you can get the link to it directly in our bio under our link tree yeah and uh we're getting awfully experimental with patreon so i think maybe we'll start exploring different interview opportunities there yeah so hit us up send us an email yeah uh five star review I'm going to read this quickly. Katie August, here for all the shenanigans. Long-time listener, first-time five-star reviewer. I was informed this was the best way to make show requests, so while emotionally I've been giving five stars every episode, I figured it's time to give an official five-star review to make my selfish request for a topic on a future episode. I know you all have had folks on to discuss hiking with dogs before, but it would be awesome to either have someone on who has ample experience backpacking with their dog to talk about the most dog-friendly medium and long trails in terms of maybe town access in case of emergencies, trail vibes, etc., I would love to start exploring more with my pup, but California is not very dog friendly. I'm itching for a road trip and some adventure with my pup and recommendations to look into. Thank you in advance and keep being your nonsensical, hilarious selves. Best podcast ever, Katie August. Katie, thank you so much. I'm moving quickly now because I'm late for a date right now. Uh, sponsor mentioned, no, a super big thank you to our Trek North World Warriors on Patreon. That is Alex and Misty with Navigators Crafting, Andrew Austin, McDaniel Austin, Ford, Brad Blair from 13 Adventures, Brent Sinberg, hey, Brian Nelson, Christopher Marshburn, Coach Mary and I was Ish. Derek Cook, Eric Casper, Currently Ghost, Eric Hoffman, Greg Knight. Greg McDaniel. Maybe his name. Jason Stiller. Barely know her. Lissy, your Patrick Scene, Cielo, Spam, Timothy Hunt. Zolo. Tracy Trigger. Thanks. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Backpacker Pod. You can follow us on Facebook.com. I'm on the internet. <laughs> All right. That's it. Uh, thank you so much for listening to today's show. I'm late for a date. Sorry, guys. Bye. Happy hiking.